We live in unprecedented times, where wondrous new technologies allow for the free sharing of information and instantaneous communication across borders and landscapes that were once unpassable. But this has brought with it the uncomfortable truth that we are all interconnected, that every single thing we do affects everyone else. Marshall McLuhan called this predicament the global village. But living in the global village doesn't mean peace and harmony. In fact, it means that we have just become more concerned and responsible for everybody else's affairs. It's no longer enough to solve the problems we face today merely within our own individual communities. Global warming and deforestation cannot be reversed by the policies of a single country, but must be a collective effort from all the countries around the world. It's no longer enough to try and fix wealth inequality within a single nation, but we must now address wealth inequality between the nations. Many argue that we should look to the past for solutions. And while much can be learned from studying the lessons of history, we must be cautious not to focus too narrowly on the backgrounds of the most dominant cultures, as this brings with it the threat of nationalism and autocracy through the willful ignorance of just how poorly our actions affect marginalized communities. Others argue that we should look to the future for solutions, where emerging technologies such as AI, digital currencies, and social networks hold the promise of solving all of our problems. However, the lack of input from the users in the design of these platforms and the underlying algorithms they use exacerbated by the cognitive blind spots of the programmers and entrepreneurs building them, results in marginalized communities becoming even more disparaged, while access to these platforms is increasingly controlled and restricted by a small handful of powerful corporations and governments who own and exploit their users' data to maintain their power. We need a middle path one that draws on the potential of these new technologies while incorporating input from the users of those technologies. Fortunately, there are innovators who are carving out this middle path, not only thinking outside the box, but outside their respective borders as well, developing new tools and systems for making group decisions, governing shared resources, and building tomorrow's global democratic infrastructure. In this program, you will hear from extraordinary people like Tyson Yunkaporta and Jim Rutt as they discuss how indigenous thinking can provide innovative solutions to help solve the problems of modern society. Ted Chang and Divya Siddharth will discuss the role of AI and the ethics of technology, as well as the importance of imagination and speculative fiction when considering the role technology will play in the future. You will also learn about emerging technologies and platforms such as Proof of Humanity, Culture Stake, and Ampled, which are empowering artists and cooperatives all over the world to govern themselves online. This is Radical Exchange, a new era of democracy. Hey everyone, welcome to the 2021 Radical Exchange Conference from myself, Glenn Weil, and my daughter, Talia Audrey Weil. We're really excited to be welcoming you all to this conference. For Talia, more than for me, we desperately need a new era of democracy. Today, more than ever, the forces shaping all of our lives are at scales that don't match with the usual ways we governed ourselves. We have climate change ravaging our world at a global scale. We have rivers being depleted across many countries. We've got networks of software and production that snake their way around the world. We don't have the capacity to govern those things democratically because our institutions aren't shaped to meet the demands of the problems that we face. What Radical Exchange is really trying to do is to build tools that make possible all the richness of the democratic interactions we'd have in a town hall 
or a club open to us at those scales in that flexible way so that when Talia grows up, she will live in a world that's much more democratic than the world that we know, not one where democracy is receding behind the forces of global commerce and bureaucratic organization. I'm Tamil, and I grew up in London after my family left the escalating ethnic violence that eventually wiped out the Tamil homeland of Elam in the north and east of what is now Sri Lanka. And I trace the roots of that conflict to the colonial imposition of democracy when the British Empire arbitrarily united the island as a nation state and left it with political parties that then inflamed racial antagonisms to get elected. When you grow up across different cultures, I think it's easier to see that one, no particular political system is inevitable. And two, maybe there's nothing all that democratic about the particular political system that we have. And what excites me about Web3 is the possibility to experiment with how we organize and govern ourselves. In a way, the COVID pandemic has inflicted on the world a large scale experiment in comparative governance. With different jurisdictions responding to the same threat at the same time, in different ways and with starkly different outcomes. And while the pandemic has exposed the tragic weaknesses of many existing institutions, it has also arguably accelerated the development of Web3, presenting now the opportunity to imagine and build new economies and political systems. Thank you so much, uh, Zizi Papakarisi, for joining today. My pleasure. I'm uh, super excited to be to be talking to you today. Zizi is a professor and head of communication department and professor of political science at University of Illinois Chicago and university scholar at the University of Illinois System and the editor of, of many journals and generally uh, one of the most eminent thinkers in media and communications that we have. I can't imagine a better sort of tour guide to help us think about how media and social media and technology are shaping our politics. And uh, very, very honored to be, uh, uh, to be speaking today. Thank you. And I love that title of an academic tour guide. You know, I've thought of myself as an academic flaneur as I was working on my latest book, but an academic tour guide is even better. I'm going to start using that. <laughs> I would love to talk a little bit about your your most recent book called After Democracy. I'm thinking maybe before we get to that, it would be good to lay some of the foundations from your earlier thinking. And in particular, I'm curious if you can tell us a little bit about the idea of uh, effective publics. I can tell you a little bit about, you know, how that idea came about. I've been working on technology, democracy, and society for a long time. I had wrapped up a few projects around 2010, 2011, and like all good ideas, you know, that idea, and I'm hoping it's still a good idea. <laughs> Most people find it a good idea. Uh, they come from a place of boredom. So I was um, just uh, sitting around on a lazy uh, Sunday afternoon for me. There's, uh, it was not lazy for the world at all. There were a lot of very interesting social movements going on. I was following the Arab Spring developments as they were moving and transitioning from Tunisia to Egypt. And then I was also following the burgeoning indignados occupy movements and what sort of presence they were attaining online and in particular how they were using twitter to attain that presence and if you think back you know on 2010 2011 twitter was a very different medium before these movements uh, people mostly used twitter to share personal thoughts uh, to often post pictures of, you know, what they had for breakfast. And that led to many conversations in mainstream media about, you know, what is the future of this? What is even the relevance? But once we saw many, many movements starting to just make a more direct 
use of the medium. The question that came up very often uh, was, you know, is Twitter, our social media, making the revolution or is the revolution making a different medium out of um, Twitter? I think uh, a little bit of both has happened. I with more heavy, heavily leaning on the latter, I think that these movements have transformed Twitter into a completely different vehicle and connective uh, conduit that supports all kinds of publics. And this is the important thing to remember. I think when we first turned to Twitter as a medium, we were all very optimistic and enthusiastic about its uh, promise for contributing to societal change. As more and more movements turn to Twitter, we see it being infiltrated with a variety of content that uh, revolves around hashtag hijacking, infusing movements with false content, uh, trolling, staffing movements with uh, bots to create you know, a false sense of engagement. So I try to talk um, about that with this concept of affective publics. And I define that very plainly and simply as networked publics, okay, publics, people across the globe who are coming together and they're connected, they're identified, but they're also potentially disbanded, disconnected through sentiment, through bonds of sentiment. So it's not necessarily an ideological connection. It's not necessarily a conversation around shared ideology that's motivated. This connection is usually a sentiment, uh, a mood, a sense that, you know, this is something that moves us and we need to create some kind of signifier. That's usually a hashtag that allows us to stand up and be counted and be visible. This is something that's happening with movements like Me Too and Black Lives Matter, but it is also facilitating movements that have deeply uh, undemocratic consequences or tend to misinform the public. And I'm speaking, of course, to the MAGA movement. I'm referring, of course, to several anti-vaxxing movements as well. So it's important to remember that effective publics support a number of of different and can develop in a number of different directions. It's not safe to assume that just because you know one movement used uh, Twitter to attain a certain kind of visibility uh, and social media presence that all movements will be that same. Every movement is unique and then every movement leaves its own unique digital imprint, its own unique societal imprint. Uh, I'm going to stop here and <laughs> let you get a word in. I have a, a few more things to say about the impact of these things. When I hear you describe this, I mean, the way, the thing that I picture, and you can tell me if I've sort of got it right or not, is groups of people who are sort of for, forming into sort of clusters who, who, who co-sympathize with each other, and they may or may not really be on the same page ideologically, but they are signifying their membership in the same group in some way so you're signifying their kind of fellow travelerness with one another this can sort of point in any different direction right i mean it could be it could be bad it could be good um, absolutely you know and i think um, this is why you see some people floating in and out of these movements you also see um you know journalists trying to interpret these movements in ways in traditional narratives or try to put them in a very conventional frame that doesn't really fit the movement. That was the case with Occupy. We had so many uh, journalists asking, well, you know, what is what is the agenda? You know, what do these publics want? What is the ideology? And they were missing the point. You know, the point was specifically that there was not to be an agenda. The point was to just demonstrate dissent indignation, the particular mode of running things, of um, of doing things. Now, unfortunately, you know, that has also been co-opted and become the modus operandi of other movements that have less of a noble, <laughs> uh, noble motivation. One thing to say about all of these things, uh, all of these sort of public formations, and I think we're going to see more and more of them in the future because they are facilitated by social media you know um, social media work by bringing out the sentiment in us and allowing that sentiment to you know just sort of run in a very viral manner i don't think we're going to see with many of these change that's instant or instantaneous or immediately political uh sociocultural economic legislative i think in most cases we'll see symbolic change or uh, a, a symbolic meaning, symbolic value to some of these movements. And let me give you some examples. So for instance, for a movement like Black Lives Matter, that phrase 
taken literally is interesting, obviously, makes a strong statement. Taken symbolically, it attains a completely different gravitas in terms of uniting people and also reminding societies how little has been accomplished that despite the years, centuries of, of civil rights struggles. To take that statement and interpret it in a literal sense, you know, it leads to a deep misunderstanding of that particular movement. These movements also they gain agency in ways that are discursive. So what they try to do is they try to change the discourse, to change the conversation, to say, well, we're using the wrong words to describe this institution with, or we have this institution and we need to rethink how we're using it. So take a movement like defund the police. Do not interpret it literally. That's the least you can get out of it. You know, nobody's saying let's fire all cops everywhere. But what people are saying is, Let's reconsider what it is uh, exactly that police officers do, what sort of training they do, what policing and law enforcement means in a contemporary democratic society, because we've been, you know, we've been running law enforcement like we still live in the medieval centuries. Even with a movement like MAGA, I will say that, you know, for a lot of these movements, this is both empowering and disempowering. The access to agency, the access to power, it's going to be of a liminal, transitional nature. That's neither good nor bad. I mean, it's not an, uh, <laughs> uh, it's not meant to be judged uh, in, in that sort of evaluative manner. I think it concerned us because um, when we saw crowds storming the Capitol building on January 6th, we were worried that that implied a lasting access to power. It does not. It's a fleeting access to power. We should be concerned if there's indication that there is, you know, a structural connection to power. And I think many of us were worried about that because it took so long for law enforcement to to respond. And I think that's something that's being looked into, that structural connection with many of the hearings and the investigations that are taking place today. But there is that liminality of access to power that, well, you know, I mean, can become, you know, part of uh, permanent structures, but that is something that will take time. You know, revolutions are long, change is gradual. We have to be resilient and persistent. It seems like if you compare these kinds of movements to to prior, more traditional sorts of movements, one of the differences is that, you know, more traditional movements might have had more of a discursive process going on within themselves to sort of define their goals or their ideology or, or it, you know, whereas these, these are more, a little bit more blank slates, which means that they can like form quick, more quickly, but then also their power, you know, is more, more liminal, more sort of e- e- ethereal. It's interesting, you know, I've thought about this um, as well, you know, I've thought about, you know, to what extent is what am I am I um, describing new or have we seen it in the past? And I think it's a little bit of both. You know, I think there are some of these trends, you know, some of this effervescence is a, is a little bit more amplified, more pronounced, more visible. And that has to do with the media that are used that sort of sustain uh, that aspect. They sustain that intensity. You know, it's, it's very quick for something to to gain to attain intensity online and for that intensity to spread. But then, you know, when I think about, you know, some of the civil rights movements of the 60s as they took form in the United States, but also in many different countries in Europe and Asia as well, you're right, you know, there was some pluralistic conversation on, you know, what is our ideological agenda and disagreement often that took place in face-to-face situations. I think there is some of that going on with these movements too, but online, in some ways, it's even more pluralized, even more inclusive. I can't say, you know, we'd have to think about whether the commitment is as lasting. But then when you read, you go back and read at how the the intellectuals of that era responded and reacted to those movements. You see a lot of people, you know, Daniel Bell in the 60s talk about the end of ideology. And then, of course, you know, 10 years later, he writes about the coming of the information society. And then you also see some other similarities. You know, we used uh, social media that uh, have this effective appeal to them, but movements of the 60s used music a lot, which again has this very effective way of appealing to the senses. So people frequently united 
behind the song, they may not have shared agreement on every single ideological point of that particular movement that they supported. But, you know, maybe it was like a Johnny Mitchell song or a Bob Dylan song that brought them together. And so they marched to that, uh, singing that. So it's a different medium that helps sustain that connective narrative. I'm curious, you know, how how these sort of fit into your like hopes and fears because what one way i could see that these things evolving is that we develop better uh methodologies for sort of achieving coherence of effective publics mm -hmm. right and for helping something a little bit more discursive go on within them they become a part of a healthy democracy right they be, you know but another thing there's obvious dangers as well like for for example because they sort of form so quickly and become because they form on the basis of affectivity instead of careful uh deliberation you can imagine two different effective publics forming that think they hate each other but don't right if they were actually talking to each other they wouldn't they, they would find they disagree about less than they than they think they do but the basis of of their grouping is opposition to one another or something so mm -hmm. yeah I, you know, when I wrote, um, when I finished writing Effective Publics, you know, I, I was thinking, you know, this is really, this could evolve in a number of different ways. And I turned that book in, you know, 2013. And it's a book that involved a number of big data analysis and also more qualitative analysis of Occupy and the Egyptian uprising that led to uh, the regime reversal of Hosni Mubarak. I had very mixed feelings, you know, the I was worried that, you know, well, we're seeing some positive effects here in terms of visibility, but, you know, we really kind of have to sort of wait and see whether, you know, substantial regime change is going to follow. It's very difficult for me to write about that at the time because there was a lot of enthusiasm about what was happening. And I think there was a lot of, you know, perhaps in the United States, we haven't played a part here because all too often I think we have a certain idea of what democracy is and we tend to sort of project it and often almost impose it on other countries. So I was very skeptical about, you know, whether that change that we're seeing was going to be lasting. I mean, you have to understand, I. I, I was born in Greece. When I was born, there was a dictatorship in the country. On the day I was born, there was a referendum to vote out uh, the king because uh, there was also a king together with the dictators. Uh, they weren't getting along, so the, <laughs> the dictators wanted to to kick the kick the kick him out. I think that's the one good thing that came out of the dictatorship. And so my mother uh, voted on the referendum to vote the king out, and then the same night <laughs> gave birth to me, which I think is weirdly symbolic when you think about uh, the work that I do. But many of us who grew up uh, in regions that have suffered through, you know, political upheaval, and a country like Greece has like such a long but also fragmented history and experience with democracy, we just tend to be very apprehensive of just how quickly things can turn around. So I was worried, but uh, I nobody really wanted to, <laughs> to hear, listen to my concerns. Although in the conversations that I was following on Twitter, a lot of the people on Egypt on the ground were very skeptical as well about Morsi, about that government, and for good reason, as we were able to see. And now, of course, we've evolved to a different sort of platform that is hospitable and platforms that are hospitable to a number of different uh, causes that articulate themselves through a variety of different ways, ways that are frequently manufactured you know, manufacturing consent, manufacturing visibility, if you want to take that Chomskyan point a little bit further, you know, making things visible. And these are often things that actually don't have very much support behind them. There's this perception of uh, visibility of support, but there's actually, you know, once you dig uh, beneath the surface, you do some, some digital forensics work, you just find bots and spiders <laughs> in there, <laughs> cobweb. I hear people talking about the idea of performativity a lot, and I'm curious how it relates to affectivity in this context. So the uh, idea of performativity is sometimes used pejoratively as if to suggest that like p there's a way of communicating that is that is less performative or more authentic, which is being displaced by a more performative kind of communication. I'm not sure what to think about that. On one level, 
I think that all communication is is performative, right? We're always performing. Nonetheless, there are some distinctions that can be made. For example, when two people are talking to each other one on one in private, there are like fewer people being performed to than than when people are are talking on social media or when people are talking in a public situation. And I'm I'm curious what you what you think about that. Do you do you think that there is some quality to communication that happens in in smaller settings or more one-to-one settings that is that we we should normatively desire compared to the more sort of like uh one-to-many communication which increasingly is what a lot of communication and en- ends up being that's such a rich question and i'd probably have to start by saying that you're right you know performativity ha- can be used in a pejorative manner but really i think it comes down to questions of security and insecurity, which in my mind, insecurity explains 95% of the world's problems. <laughs> I think people are forced to be performative in some way when for some reason they don't feel secure in their environment. They don't feel that they're going to come across as their true selves, as who they really find themselves to be. You know, they're not going to present a version of themselves that really they feel represents who they want to be, how they feel on the inside. So they resort to this, a variety of different strategies. That's not something to, to blame individuals for. I mean, all too often, you know, think of the politicians and all too often we have them communicate to publics in stages and platforms that really invite the performative. I mean, show me one person who feels at home on a television screen, you know, how is that a natural environment, a natural habitat for the human being? Everything about that environment is fake, is constructed, you know, down to the set, the lighting, the makeup, everything. So for somebody to go on TV, you know, as I say in uh, my latest book, After Democracy, politicians have to play a part to appear to be themselves on TV. You know, you take someone like Hillary Clinton, she behaves, you know, normally, we don't like how she looks. She then tries to put on a different performance, then we find that a little bit too affected. It's it's very confusing. It's especially challenging for women, for uh, publics of color as well. You know, it's a fascinating concept that... uh, a scholar named Rolina Joseph came up with. It's called Strategic Ambiguity. And there she talks about how women of color often, upon arriving to a room, they just have a practice of reading the room and just figuring out basically what it looks like and how how Black can they be <laughs> or whether they need to sort of put on a different kind of performance. It's sad, you know, because we are not providing the circumstances that allow people to feel secure enough to communicate in a way that feels authentic to them. But then now I will also say that it's very difficult to do that in mass societies. And uh, that gets to the point where, you know, the one-on-one, one-to-many, how can you do that in a conversation that involves more and more people? You know, an authentic and impromptu and a spontaneous conversation, it's very difficult for that to scale up. We can do it, but we have to figure out how to design technologies and design environments, not just technologies, you know, spaces that support that. And the thing is that frequently when we're designing spaces, you know, the number one criteria is, you know, the efficiency economy. And then, you know, an afterthought is, oh, and by the way, (laughs) does this work? This is actually, is this appealing to people? So in After Democracy, I talk about that as, you know, let's make, capitalism softer, let's make democracy stronger by reversing, reversing this trend. The first question I'd I'd like to to ask is, can you explain the, uh, your thinking around the title of uh, After Democracy? In a way, it's sort of a a provocative title and curious how you arrived at it. It is a provocative title and it's often, uh, people are worried when they hear it because they think I'm speaking about the end of democracy, basically, that I'm talking about, you know, I've seen some things and they're alarming. And they're going to make democracy go away. But that's really, that really wasn't my starting point for that book at all. My starting point was quite different. I started thinking about the book during the Obama presidency. And, you know, I would be giving a lot of talks on uh, affective publics. And I was thinking through the trends. Uh, You know, you mentioned some of them before we said, where are we? And we're really all thinking the same things, but we need to find a better way of talking about them. 
So as I was traveling the world thinking um, and speaking to people about these things, I would get into conversations with random strangers, you know, like the cab driver who took me to a talk or just, you know, like um, the security personnel that I would chat with as I was, you know, waiting to go on stage. And I thought, you know, what if I could just pull all these conversations together and turn them into a story about democracy? But I wasn't writing that story because I was worried about democracy going away. I was writing that story because I was seeing politicians who were interested in doing very different things with the world that we live in. And I felt often as I was observing them, and one of them, of course, is Barack Obama, I felt that they were trapped in structures that were old, that they were dated. I felt like it felt, you know, we were making them sleep in the bed that they slept in when they were six years old, you know, (laughs) or get them, you know, to fit into the clothes that they were wearing when they were teenagers. And we were trying to do the same thing as well. So I felt we were running a very dated version of democracy. And here we had people around the world, actually, not just in the United States, who had come from the future or who had come from like just a very energized present. And they were kept bumping uh, into very just sort of sort of stiff, rigid um, structures that were pulling them back. So I wrote after democracy because I wanted to imagine, I wanted to ask the question, what about democracy? You know, is it the is it the best thing that we can come up with? Is it the only thing that we can come up with? It's been around uh, for thousands of years. It doesn't really scale up very well. It was invented within the scope of a society that was very different. Can we uh, evolve beyond that? Is there something beyond it? Is there is democracy the final stop in our civic journey? Or are there more stops? Are there stops, you know, three, four, five, infinite number? And then we can kind of... Uh, I use technology to build out railways, you know, in the same way that we did, you know, to support and invest in the railway infrastructure and then connect us to other worlds. Use technology in the same way to connect us to others and help reinvent some of the way that we function civically. So, I mean, all of those themes are very close to my heart and close to what we're working on at Radical Exchange Foundation. I mean, I'm also struck by the the way that the book is put together sort of instantiates a, a democratic ethos because you center the voices of uh, a very large, diverse group of people and let um, let them sort of articulate a an, an idea of what comes after democracy or or what's next? A couple sort of questions about that. You know, one is how did you make the choice to structure the to to structure the book that way? I guess, and and also, you know, having having gathered all of these voices together, how do we scale it up? Right? How do we how, how do we take the this the, the all of these ideas and uh, sort of translate them to to the 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 next level of of organization and democratic infrastructure. I'll put a pin in it already. Like it, 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 it already kind of touches back on what I was suggesting earlier, which is that there's something in the one-to-one conversations, right? Because uh, the, the, these interactions that, that you had that were the basis of the material in the book were, 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 were one-to-one. Now, pe- they, were, they be also become public through the book, there's a certain sort of safety or security that the people uh, who you were talking to undoubtedly had that it is probably has something to do with the honesty and the richness. Thank you. I mean, that's such a, an interesting and intelligent way to, to phrase that question. You know, you're kind of sort of telling me that I practiced what I'm preaching before I decided that that was <laughs> what I was going to preach to begin with. I did decide that at some point, you know, there's a lot of experts talking about democracy and uh, many of them are professors who are talking about what should happen and how it should happen. And, you know, I mean, who gave us the baton and made us the grand deciders? Let's use our position uh, to give voice to other people and try to just put together those stories. I also had written a number of, you know, conventional academic books, and I was just ready to do something very, very different and to approach it in a very different way. And I had an even much more expansive plan of traveling to many different countries, but uh, many more different countries, but that was not possible. Uh, I, again, I came up with the idea because I had those one-on-one conversations. And like you, I thought, well, 
this can really come up to a, com they can be pieced together into a very interesting narrative, but we need someone to tell the story in a way that's loyal to what people actually said. And we have ways of guaranteeing that that happened in terms of our methodology and how we run the interviews to ensure that we're not misquoting people and uh, we're not misunderstanding something and all of that. But what I'm trying to say is that perhaps there's a way to translate that into the way we run democracies or what might follow democracies. Again, we see a lot of professions that are not becoming relevant, but we haven't made room and we haven't allowed ourselves to imagine uh, new professions might, that might be created solely for the purpose of serving democracy and facilitating those kinds of connections, you know, so we could have conversational moderators, we could have uh, community conduits, we could have people whose job it is to, you know, go and uh, speak, have these one-on-one -on -one conversations, but they're trained to pull them together in, um, in an authentic and reflective and reflective way and then share them with other groups and then eventually share them with politicians. I think we're asking people of too much. Uh, you know, people are working more hours than they ever have, and especially, and they're going through a pandemic, and they're also saturated with information. So they have to work, they have to process information, they have to know everything about the world. And then politicians, of course, we want them to run the country and be educated about everything, but at the same time, they must campaign. And, you know, in the United States, they start campaigning so early. So I think in order in order to run something and scale it up, we just need more people for the operation. And we need to just really think about, you know, curators of content, storytellers, you know, rethink the role of the librarian in an information society, grow that out, you know, parse it out so that we have these interlocutors interspersed throughout democratic societies who are making sure that that communication channels, the communication lines are not broken. I mean, I think we've always assumed that the media would do that. The media are business and, you know, they haven't been doing a very good job at that for many reasons. I don't want to put everyone, I mean, I don't want to point the finger at all the media. You know, there's journalists, there's people working in those organizations and they do, many of them do a very nice job. But it's the general mentality, you know, there's a financial foundation structure of the media organization that's not very friendly to, uh, to doing these kinds of things, to telling these stories that take time and take space and are not, you know, cannot be shared with the public on the scroller. <laughs> I mean, what you said just excites me and resonates with me a lot because I, I think that the... You, this idea that the sort of democratic infrastructure that we need to build needs to be like human is really important, right? So that you, you, you can imagine, I mean, there are certain functions in society that humans are, will always be better positioned to serve. Just to share a sort of a personal thing. So, I mean, I, I used to, uh, I spent a year uh, clerking for a judge. It was an interesting, eye-opening experience for me because the, I think that that function that judges play like what, what judges do is a very, very unique and important thing that has to happen in society, right? Somebody needs, some people need to sort of make, there are certain kinds of interpretations and judgments that people need to make. They need to be, they need to sort of happen with embedded within the social fabric. And like, that's what, that's what judges are doing. And it occurred to me when I was working there that like, there's like a several hundred federal judges or whatever you know, why aren't there more people doing this, right? There needs to be more of this happening, right? It needs to be happening at all these different levels of society. And so the idea of kind of a, a you know, a network, a proliferating network of like facilitators who are helping, you know, democracy happen, who are helping, you know, democracy sort of roll up from the ground level to the medium level to the higher level is a really compelling, um, compelling vision to me. If we think about the positive potentials for, you know, technology and democracy. I think it has a lot to do with like helping that happen. It's true. Otherwise we end up simplifying, you know, everything. And then we present people with these just sort of false binaries or, you know, um, questions that have only yes or no option or options, or, you know, do you like, do you want to vote for this candidate or not? What questions in life can you ask an answer with a yes or no? I mean, there's even like the simplest of questions, you know, like, are you hungry? You can't really answer with a straight yes or a no.
I'm not sure if you uh, are, have, have ever come across the idea of like quadratic voting, which is, you know, what we're, you know, a big part of our, of our work, but, you know, that is in a way an attempt to, to increase the richness of information, you know, to make it to, to, so that the information that's being passed from, from, from voters to, you know, the uh, democratically responsive authority is richer than yes, no. I agree. And I, I mean, I crossed paths with that idea uh, and it's an uh, enthusiastic ambassador so, while I was writing the book. And that was part of the connection that we formed and how we started conversing together. You will forgive me. I will say that I think it needs a, a name that's more relatable to the general public. But I think the general idea is fantastic. And it's all about offering a, a wider menu of options for citizens to select from. But still, I think, you know, uh, in order for that to happen, we need a lot of support people on the ground. We need these sort of facilitators who are going to be able to then work with the micro communities and figure out what are the, you know, the trigger points? What are, what are the important issues for that community? What are the, what is the balance between the issue, uh, the issues and the candidates in those communities so that, you know, the quadratic aspects of that can be configured accurately? I do think that, you know, there is, there's a positive part that, you know, AI can play in all of this. I think it can help us enhance our abilities to process things, but it's not something to be tasked to AI on its own. I think uh, there's many ways in which I think we might be able to use AI to enhance our memory. I think there's also many ways in which we may use AI to help us um, train ourselves better when it comes to reimagining ways of doing things. I think we're very focused on uh, cultivating critical literacies and that's very, very important. We still have a long way to go there, no doubt. But I think we also need to start doing and start teaching our children and future generations the important work of once literate, then you have to be able to imagine different ways of doing things. You know, we're doing so many things. We're like sleeping, eating, dating, loving, living in the same ways that we've been doing for centuries. And again, I, I mean... I, I have to ask, you know, does this really match? You know, we're using all these habits that are dated and don't really seem, they're retrofitted so that they can um, work in our society. But, you know, what does the institution of marriage, for instance, mean in societies where women are much more autonomous? So that needs to be thought over. I think there's a lot of interesting potential for AI to help people understand each other actually. Like, it's funny how rarely you hear people talking about that as a potential application, right? People, it's always sort of like, like AI will help us manipulate the inert external world, you know, as opposed to, you know, helping us actually see what one, see what one another mean, you know, help, you know, give the sort of context so that we, you know, can bridge misunderstandings between ourselves and things like that. There's no reason AI can't do that. I think so. You know, if you get me started on this, I think people will start thinking that I've been watching too many sci-fi movies. <laughs> but I I mean, I think back to uh, the late 90s and when I first started studying these issues, mid 90s, actually, and when Wired was a fascinating uh, publication to read and we were just running to look at it when it was published. And I as a, as a young professor, I had, you know, a whole display of all the Wired magazines and their colorful spies. And it was just such a wonderful, techy, artful background and backdrop to my office. And of course, I don't read Wired the same way that I did then. But they were doing a lot of stories on, you know, transhumanism and prosthetics, chip implants, because there was so little work on society and the internet done at the time. I mean, I had to draw, we had to draw a lot of information inspiration from places like Wired, but also from science fiction novels that uh, we read on how. So that's very much influenced, you know, in my, my thinking of how, how AI can enhance our ways of being and communicating. You know, there was, I remember in, uh, I think there's a novel by Bruce Sterling called Holy Fire, and uh, the characters had a wig that they could put on that enabled them to speak all kinds of different languages. So I'm still waiting for that. <laughs> for that technology to appear. So when I talk about transhumanism and, um, you know, using AI to work in those ways and imagining different things, 
and I think, and of course, we can imagine things better than wigs and definitely things better than robots that look like pets. I'm thinking about things that, you know, looking at AI and right now I'm working with some of my students on thinking of ways in which or we train intelligence after not human intelligence, but after the intelligence of nature. So we try because it's, you know, we've been, you know, as humans, we think perhaps we're a little bit too important and (laughs) a little bit too superior. We're certainly a form of intelligence, but I think we have a lot to learn from the intelligence of trees and how they nurture nature. And perhaps we can, you know, and and a lot of AI scientists are actually following that model, looking at microorganisms, looking at other organisms of nature that support uh, fungi, for instance, to support nature in a variety of different ways to learn and design those kinds of things. This is what I'm thinking. That's the line of thought that I'm very interested in when I talk about a certain, you know, transhumanism coming into the conversation. Maybe one day we'll come come up with a better word for that. But you know, finding a way to use technologies to um, to build better bridges. You know, bridges are wonderful because we cross them. Uh, for a variety of reasons, you know, we, we cross them to conquer. We also cross them to for commerce, to get closer to each other. But the whole time we're crossing them, we, we can still see the rivers that are separating us. So we're not losing sight of our differences. We remember why we built them. You know, we remember what separated us. We don't, so we don't forget our history, but we are still using something that enables us to, to move forward. Now, the question for me is those bridges that we build, can they be built for profit? Uh, yeah, <laughs> so it's exactly what I was thinking. Yeah. Um, and then the question that I have back for you is, can they be, if they're built for profit, can they also support democracy? No, no, is there no. A way I don't do think, this? I'm not saying yes. <laughs> no, no, no. Um, no, but I'm asking the question. Yeah. Can we come up? with a way that you know they're built for profit so they're sustainable financially they're not just profit oriented so they're not supporting uh commodification and commercialization and in the reasons or the purposes why we cross they're also supporting a number of different activities so i think it's a question of the afterthought you know if we design them uh, with democracy as the the precursor, as the yeah. reason, as the rationale for this, I think we'll end up seeing a very good impact on for profit organizations. Uh, I think we'll I think we'll be able to get capitalism to work in ways that we haven't seen it work uh, yet, and might surprise us, and it might make it more efficient. I mean, again, we are running capitalism. I don't think if we ever if we ever ran it properly, but we're definitely running like, you know, the 16th century, you know, like 15th century model version of it for a society that's really using very, very different tools and is based in an economy that's really, really much more reliant on a, on the politics of the stock market than it should be. My worry is that, is that these, these, if we try to build these bridges between ourselves in the service of democracy with technology. I worry that the profit motive in the stewardship of those bridges or the construction of those bridges is distorting. It distorts the signals that we're able to, distorts the way that we're able to understand each other. It sort of, it's like, in, it's, an, it's an interposition, you know, between communicating subjects. It's never, its interests will never be the same as the interests of, of, of democracy. And these and that sort of distortive effect can get looped in on itself exponentially, right? So, so I actually, I mean, I have just speaking for myself. I mean, I have very serious worries about whether capitalism is is compatible with the, the construction of the of democratic infrastructure at all. I mean, I, I for example, I think you know, and this is coming going back to the idea of like a judge, right? You can't have a judge for profit. The judge has to be loyal to something else. Um, and similarly, I think like a facilitator of a, of a town hall, you know, or the, or a facilitator of, of a, of a democratic deliberative process that we're trying to roll up to a larger consensus or something like that. 
cannot have any conflict of interest, right? That, that, that human role has to be, has to be answering to something that has nothing to do with shareholders. Um, I, I mean, I share the same concerns, you know, primarily because I haven't seen any examples in our history, uh, past, past or recent, that um, might indicate otherwise. But I think that that is because, again, we've been using this very dated model of capitalism, and we have this conviction that this is the model of capitalism that works the best. And we're forgetting that, you know, it's a model of capitalism that was um, was developed when societies were not really very democratic. You know, uh, democracy really wasn't a thing. So we're using something, of course, you know, we're using something that wasn't created to support um, democracy. It was something that, you know, was put in place in uh, feudal states, you know, it supported monarchies, it supported a completely different kind of leadership. So yes, absolutely, capitalism in, in its current form cannot, it runs contrarian um, to democracy, and we let it run in a way where it just sort of becomes much more autonomous and stronger, and this uh, uh, thing that just kind of runs on its own, whereas at the expense of democracy. So it, it would be one thing if the two were separated, but all of this is happening at the accept, expense, at the softening of democracy. So my argument would be that we also revise capitalism. And then the way that I would sell it to the capitalists is that there's a way to do this better and also serve democracy. There's actually a way to, to run things more efficiently. And if you want to make more money <laughs> and make more profit... There is a way to do that while also having a very um, direct democratic conscience. I that you know that's my point of view. But yes, in its current iteration, in its present form, no, you know we're running something that really just doesn't that really just doesn't fit democracy at all. I think ideologically we're on almost exactly the same page, but we're trapped in two <laughs> different effective publics because my, what, uh, I, what, what I want to, I want to say capitalism, let's not use that word anymore. Right. What word should we use? Yeah. Let's yeah. come up with a better word. I'm not opposed to that because yeah. it does create a lot of negative sentiment. Yeah. Um, then on the other hand, if we use, you know, socialism that, you know, is so misunderstood in the United States right. Right. in the European union, all of the countries have had their love affairs. And then like every love affair, there's, a, you know, at a point in the end where you're like tragically depressed <laughs> when yeah. it's over. Yeah. So all the Euro European countries have had their love affairs with socialism. So yes, let's, let's come up with better vocabulary. I mean, when yeah. I say let's do over capital, come up with a better word. Yeah, of course. yeah exactly. I, I just, I just, I don't, and I don't know what the word is actually, but the, <laughs> Uh, I mean, maybe the word is democracy, you know, but, but, but I was thinking the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to say let's fix capitalism because I feel like it, it in the contestation for that word, I'm I, the hedge fund people will always win. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? Like, I can't, I, I don't have enough purchase on that word to, to, to play tug of war over it. So I want to find a new, a new, uh, vocabulary. I think there's a way to, you know, I mean, yes, because it it's no longer a capitalism. It's like, you know, hedge fundism, actually. <laughs> it's it's yeah, transformed yeah. into that. You know, it's really basically, um, it's not even a stock market. It's, it's a massive globally operated gambling market that's based on expectations and how those are read. And then at this point, manipulating those expectations and using social media to manipulate those expectations, you know, ever more expertly. So, yes, but I mean, I think I, I have faith, you know, in the brains of scientists and also in the in the brains of young people uh, to come up with something that might be appealing to hedge funds uh, because, you know, they're also at some point, you know, I mean, they can't keep outsmarting every all, each other indefinitely. I mean, at some point they're going to get tired and they're going to need to move on to the next best thing. And then, so 
then, you know, perhaps uh, there we might be standing ready to offer that. It is, you know, if you watch these economic cycles, they just keep moving from one to the next. But at some point, you know, uh, everybody learns each other's tricks and they have to invent new ones. So let's invent the next new one. <laughs> let's have it involve democracy. <laughs> And without being corporate, you know, I say, so when I say sell it, my academic friends say, oh, we don't want to be corporate. And I'm not, you know, just because I'm presenting something in a particular frame doesn't mean that I'm being corporate. Uh, let's, uh, let's frame it in a way that that's appealing. Yeah. Corporate. That's a word that is not, doesn't have a good <laughs> reputation. I know. <laughs> um, I'm curious. Uh, so, I mean, what, one of the most interesting uh, takeaways from after democracy that or that left me just sort of w wondering, I guess, is is um, you talked to people who are apparently at opposite ends of the political spectrum who are just saying things that were shockingly similar um, to to one another. What do you think is going on there? Look, wh wh why do you think why do you think it? Because I've uh, you know. Uh, Candidly, I've noticed the same thing. Actually, you know, when I when I talk to people who are on the 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 right or on the left, it's like they're telling me the same things. And um, what's happening? I think it's populism. You know, I think again, it's that you know manufacturing of a particular uh, voice or presentation or uh, point of view and presenting it as the um, as the voice of the many, as the point of view of the many, and often, you know, misrepresenting many of the micro points of view that <laughs> came together or lie behind it. This is why I write in the book about this idea of forgetting messiahs, because all too often, you know, we look at people and we do this in our personal lives as well. You know, we uh, we seek out friends, you know, we seek out partners in this way uh, who will complete us <laughs> who will make us feel uh, like they will s solve our problems and the, the truth is you know I mean you want to talk about it from a philosophical point of view you want to go see a therapist and talk about it. everybody will tell you you're the only person who can complete yourself and you're the only person who can solve your own problems and until you reach that uh, level of you know self-knowing and self-reliance you you're not going to be able to make decisions that will serve you well and that's fine because you know there's a lot in that process of learning but I think it's a mistake that we make in our personal lives I think we make it in our civic lives we just we use criteria um, that are not fit for electing leaders. We look at them as, as if we're expecting, you know, the, the next um, Messiah to, to come, up, come up and emerge and save us from all of our problems. And that's a, not just a deeply problematic expectation, it's a deeply un unrealistic expectation. And now, mind you, I'm not saying that, you know, I mean, there's nuance here. I'm not saying that these people are not charismatic. They can be a little bit charismatic, but, you know, there's charisma and then there's the Messiah. And, you know, the Messiah is essentially a BS artist. Um, I think as a person who's able to, you know, take a story, an idea, a truth uh, that they have heard and distort it into something else in order to make false promises, blown out of proportion promises, and then um, shift, uh, energize uh, public opinion. So I think when we talk to each other, we find out that we have a lot in common. But when we're described by messiahs, it uh, we're made to think like we're, you know, sort of standing uh, that like there's only binaries, you know, there's only dichotomies in this world, and we're just sort of standing on opposite on opposite ends. So I I think we have to be very distrustful of people who present as messiahs, and we have to be very distrustful of people who want to pit us on opposite sides. I think we have to be a little bit more trusting of people who are ready who acknowledge our differences, uh, but, you know, want to do the hard work of connecting us. Well, I, do, I guess I am worried there's a deeper problem than messiahs, actually, because because the what I think messiahs are doing is um, 
they're making it worse. They're telling a story. They're telling really clear stories that sort of divide people. But the sort of symbolic material that they're using to create those stories like exists without the messiahs too. So, so for example, you know, uh, to make concrete what I'm saying, like if just think about the idea of like nationalism or national identity, right? Like that, you know, I don't know. I mean, Germanness and Italianness are there even before the demagogues show up in Germany and Italy, right? So there's like all this material that is that is already dividing people before the you know messiah figures come along and like exacerbate it. Yeah, they certainly they you know they're um, they're not in. I mean, there have been some cases where they invent something out of nothing. That there are such examples, but in many cases, they're taking a, a problem. Again, they're taking a fear. They're taking an insecurity, basically, and they're exploiting it. They're turning it into something completely different. In many, you know, they're taking historical background. You know, you talked about, you know, Germany. You talked about Italy. Um, you no, know, Italy uh, has seen its own share of civil wars. Germany has also seen division. So there's a lot of binaries there that are, you know, ripe for... Uh, <laughs> the picking you know they're ready to be exploited by messiahs and we have seen that happen in the past and then therein i think lies our own responsibility in the book i make um 10 recommendations but i say they must all work together you know we can't just follow one and forget about the other ones therein lies our own responsibility to be civic adults you know to just sort of own up to our own responsibilities and be distrustful uh, of those people and uh, and question them. I mean, those things are always going to, th- those tensions will always exist. We can only hope that they will become a little bit softer as we grow as, uh, as societies and as we make democracies stronger, as we replace capitalism with a better word and a better system, uh, as we put in all these interlocutors that help make these conversations better so that we can be better civic adults so that we have other people to speak with and you know tune these messiahs out as we also develop media that facilitate these slower conversations instead of like you know tapping along to the rhythm to the very stock marketing rhythm of this like new scroller that just sort of minimizes everything into a clickbaity headline all of these things need to come into play so that we're less vulnerable to these tendencies, so that we have all of these things in our civic environment that are nudging us out of out of traps like that. So uh, on the one hand, it's on us. And then on the other hand, we need to build a better architecture that helps us be less vulnerable to these all of these tendencies that, you know, We'll we'll be vulnerable and we'll exist um, ad infinitum. You know they're part of human nature. It's kind of like how you build a house. You know, do you build a house <laughs> just so that you can keep others out, or do you build a good solid house that will help you live a better life? You you make a a, a really great point that people seem to be retreating into a into more private spheres to make politics more meaningful or to sort of practice politics in a way that feels more meaningful to them? They do, you know, they, I think they're often, um, they're often let down. And especially I think with the, the, the pol- they've been doing so for a long time, but I think especially with the politics of this pandemic, we've been forced to retreat into microspheres uh, that guarantee our own public health i'm sorry our own health and security and also and also our sanity to a uh, to a certain extent you know the reasons behind behind that are manifold um but i think the takeaway point from that is is this that you know we've been using technology we've been using something like the internet for the wrong kind of thing you know we've been using the internet to do to enable broadcasting of many to many and one to many and all of that when we know as you pointed out that we're trying to scale things up that are not really you know they're going to lose context they're going to lose substance as a scale up when in fact we could be using technology 
better uh, in different ways to just sort of take these one-on-one -on -one conversations and layer them up, build these like imbricated layers that eventually add up to something that's much more sophisticated. So it's just using, using the internet in a very simplistic way, just because somebody told us that, you know, we can all communicate across the globe with it. We assume that, you know, we're going to oh, great, you know, this is a great platform and it can certainly be that but it can be many other things as well when i think about what messiahs do or what demagogues do is they like they take these private stories and they unify them they aggregate them into a big story i don't know if it's safe that they take a private story i think they they take insecurity and fear i think if historically if you looked at when messiahs have thrived or where it's usually in publics that feel very financially insecure. So they they take somebody's problems, somebody's financial insecurities. Uh, they take people who feel like they've been left behind for a variety of reasons. Part of it is a flawed capitalism. Part of it has to do with a very soft democracy. And they they exploit those fears, they exploit those insecurities. And I mean, these people are vulnerable enough to begin with. So it's, it's very difficult to, to hold it against them. But, uh, you know, that is, that is precisely what they do, they get elected into office, and very soon they forget about the people who put them into office. But, you know, if you look at how, you know, Hitler employed rhetoric uh, to rise to power. He exploited it, deeply held financial insecurities of the Germans that were associated with the stock market crash and used them specifically to target Jewish populations who were involved in banking. If you look at what Donald Trump did, he went around and he was advised to do so in, in areas that have historically been uh, not just financially unstable, but vulnerable to persuasion, uh, vulnerable to the rhetoric of messiahs. I mean, a lot of those counties that, you know, put him into, elected him into office and then elected him out of office have traditionally been counties that, you know, flip, flip back and forth because of financial instability. Much of it is related to globalization and much of it is related to to the inability to, you know, coal industry, you know, to decide what to do with certain uh, re, uh, energy resources and how to redirect the industry there so that we don't lose jobs, but at the same time, we're helping make happen a more sustainable future. So a lot of, a lot of those problems have been ignored for some time. They were ignored during these campaigns that, again, are supposed to last for a, a year and a half when somebody is also running the country. So it's many different things contributing to that. But at the end, it points down to, I don't think, you know, they're exploiting stories. I think they're exploiting fears, vulnerabilities, insecurities. And that's going to keep happening because <laughs> fear, fear is a part of human nature. So we just kind of have to, to train ourselves to just deal with it in different ways. Um, yeah. That's... And we have to become more secure societies too. You know, without disagreeing with anything you said, so sort of like, yes, yes, and, you know, the, the, there's like a, it does seem to me that there are people who are vulnerable to demagogues who are not financially insecure, for example, right? And, and, <laughs> and, <laughs> and yes, let's talk about those <laughs> rascals. <laughs> those are the tough cases, right? Um, and there are other forms of insecurity besides financial security, right? I mean, people are, there are, people are, made insecure people can be insecure about the future people can be insecure people feel a sense of incoherence in the world people are afraid of death people are always going to have fears right i mean one of the things that i took got away from after democracy which maybe i'm just cu i'm curious if you know is it's almost like we need to be comfortable with less of a clean story <laughs> does that make sense it does. It does. You know, especially when we're um, when we're judging politicians, I think we have to understand, you know, what's important and what's marginally significant. Because when you were saying before, you know, well, there's the people who are, you know, financially vulnerable and then there's those who are not and they support the messiahs. And then my response would be, well, then and you mentioned judges and I would say, well, then that is where di diplomacy comes in. 
And that's where we have to um, elect leaders who know how to do their jobs. And perhaps we need to understand that these people have to be good negotiators in some ways, among other things. But I, I don't know that we're always uh, ready to elect, you know, the, the person who's going to be able to represent our interests in a way that's fair, while at the same time being able to hold court to a very noisy conversation that at the present time, in the present model, includes, you know, lobbyists. Eventually, we can start, you know, we can move forward to, and make lobbyists a little bit less relevant to, to these forms of decision makings. But based on how, you know, we run elections, how we fund elections, and then um, how we run campaigns, and when we have campaigns take place, at least, at least in the United States, uh, you know, we're just encouraging diplomacy and we're sort of en- um, encouraging this sort of uh, clientelism, you know, basically. Do you have thoughts on the the role that like artists or media makers can play in um, supporting democracy or bringing about sort of a, um, a a different way of understanding how we how we can relate to each other? Yes, I have so many thoughts. Uh, you know, artists, media makers, and scientists, I think, can uh, play a huge part. I think journalists need to develop more of a habit of talking to scientists and also helping us tell better stories. Because I think often, um, you know, we're not trained to, to speak, speak in plain terms. We have to, uh, and that's not a priority in our field, you know, because we have to get tenure and do all these other things. But then once we do those things, we have to train ourselves to speak in terms that are relatable and understandable to the broad public. And we could definitely use the help of journalists in that and communicating our findings. But we could also, you know, we would also be appreciate, you know, developing more of like a sacerdotal relationship with journalists where we're not like really rushed, you know, to give you a soundbite in like, you know, 10 seconds, but we can have like a slightly longer conversation, not, you know, like hours, just like 10 minutes where we share key findings and perhaps we get some advice from journalists on how to share those in the best ways. I think that would lead to a much better informed public. Artists and media makers, I think, have already done so much in terms of informing the public and telling uh, telling stories that draw from science. And there's a lot, again, you know, when I say that over the past 20, 30 years, I mean, this this sort of balance between a strong capitalism, soft democracy, there's just there's this distance has been widening. I mean, I remember when I first started as an academic, they were there were government dedicated funds that went to support research in education that uh, was focused on how how to use technology to make democracy better to support the arts to support media making to support those forms of storytelling there were actually grants like that like th- that we could apply for ever since you know our most recent meddling post 9/11 with the middle east all of those funds have been gradually taken away, and they, all the grants that we see have to do with cybersecurity, our cybersecurity infrastructure, as if that is, you know, the only avenue that a society can pursue in terms of research and that a government can support. So, uh, not only can they play a big part; I mean, they can. They are the people who help us reimagine, you know, they're the, the imaginary repositories of a society. That's where we go when we need to think of better ways of doing things, you know. And so absolutely, uh, they play a big part, you know, uh, I applaud uh, technology companies who bring in media makers, who support artists, and I would only encourage them to make them a more, a bigger part of the conversation, a more vocal part of the conversation when it comes to how how to design a platform, how to design an interface, and then also how to design the next thing. Because, I mean, these things that we're using today, we're just, you know, in a couple of years, we're just going to evolve out of them. So into something different. And it'd be wonderful if, you know, an artist can imagine uh, what that could be. Perhaps there's like a sheet that I shake or like a curtain that I draw and then internet appears or something like that. (laughs) Or, Or none of those things and it's in the air particles thank you so much for the thank time you. uh i mean what a what a uh 
uh, privileged to be able to speak to you. I'm really grateful. No, the privilege is mine. I, it's uh, it has been such a wonderful conversation. So interesting, and I I learned a lot. You helped me think about many things. Uh, help me, help me advance my thinking. The nation state is the usual way we think about democracy. We think of democracy happening in a particular geographic territory for a particular set of people who've historically lived there, often sharing a language and a history. Today, so many of the things that affect us stretch across nations or within them. So for example, the Amazon River stretches across about six countries and only covers a small part of most of those. It's incredibly important to the global ecosystem that allows us to avoid climate catastrophe. And yet it has this fragmented governance in the conflict between a bunch of countries, each of which is only partly focused on it. That is a entity that should have a democratic governance over it. There is no entity that really corresponds to the Amazon River. There's no entity that really corresponds to the people who are most affected by the drug war in the United States. There's no entity that really corresponds to the communities of interest, whether they be around a cryptocurrency, around transgender issues, around racial injustice. There are a bunch of national holidays that exist for historical reasons, but that don't necessarily correspond to the way in which social life has evolved. What we need to find a way to do is to allow those communities to govern themselves and to gain the power to emerge as just as legitimate and just as meaningful as the geographical nation states. That doesn't mean geographical nation states should go away. In fact, I think they can benefit precisely from embracing these networks, but it does mean that they're not a sufficient foundation for governance today. Hi, my name is Austin and I'm a co-founder of Ampled. Today I want to talk to you about our product, our mission, and how you could become involved in our co-op today and help participate as a community member. The music industry doesn't work for artists. Last year, musicians made only 12% of all music industry revenues. 12. And another scary number is 2020. That's the year that we're living in. And the primary revenue source for artists of live performance and touring has pretty much all but disappeared. And we have no idea when the end um, of this crisis is in sight. So the problem is that musicians aren't paid equitably and giving direct support to them is difficult. If we look at existing market trends, we see physical and digital sales continue to decline and streaming rates continue to go from bad to worse. So we have this opportunity that artists need support, artists want support, from the way that they're recording and releasing music, they often have surplus content that doesn't live on other platforms, and their listeners are often eager to directly support their favorite artist, especially if it's through an organization that they feel like aligns with their values. Ampled is a web platform that allows musicians to be directly supported by their community with simple, direct, recurring monthly payments. So Ampled is like a Patreon for music as a co-op. That means it's collectively owned by its artists and workers. So Ampled's mission is to make music more equitable for artists and to operate transparently and ethically. Here's how it works. Here's a product page of Zimba, who is an artist owner of Ampled. Um, artists create a page for free and post unique or exclusive content, um, which is available to the public or either for their supporters only. And each artist can be supported directly for $3 a month or whatever people would want above that. And the average support amount right now is about $6. So here's an example of how the content works. This is Renee Klajic's page. Um, she goes by the name Ziemba. She's an artist owner of Ampled and just released a new album. And on her Ampled page, she's posting demos and alternate versions of all the songs before they come out. 
the co-op model actually helps unlock a number of unique competitive advantages against a really large company. So Ampled is owned by its artists and workers rather than Patreon, which is owned by VC and private equity investors. This means that value at Ampled is captured by artists rather than extracted from them. Economic rewards are shared by many rather than concentrated to few. But we're motivated by service to members rather than growing and serving financial maximization. Our revenue model isn't a rent-seeking platform fee. It's a commons contribution that artists pay to help build and grow the platforms that they own. Our goal is sustainable independence rather than selling the company or going public. And we make decisions democratically rather than autocratically. So we see this play out in a number of ways that make Ample significantly more attractive to musicians. In terms of governance and decision making and ownership, artists have a say in all of it. Um, we are financially transparent and our accountability interests are structurally aligned amongst stakeholders. And it's all built on a foundational mission and ethos that aligns with artists. And people are paying attention. So we've received uh, write-ups in a number of, of uh, press outlets. Uh, we've been a part of Start Co-op and New Inc, which is the cultural incubator as part of the new museum in New York City. Our favorite um, hyperbolic headline that we've received was how a punk-inspired collective beat the streaming giants at their own game. Um, to be clear, this is not a picture of us. Uh, Lizzie No is a um, Queens-based Americana singer-songwriter, uh, is an artist owner of Ampled. And she's receiving um, enough support that's actually fully paying her rent through the platform right now. And she says, up until now, my idea of success was to play music and not have a day job. It seemed impossible to fathom, but thanks to Ample, it has happened in the past month. Our team um, looks and feels more like a collective than a traditional startup. We have over 30 people helping build and grow Ample um, and investing their time and labor through a time banking system that we made. Um, and we have senior employees from Kickstarter, Spotify, and Patreon, to name a few. This is a bit of an unusual pitch in that we're not asking for investment, we're actually asking for participation. So we want to ask you to become a part of our co-op as a community member. We have artist owners, worker owners, and we've carved out this third stakeholder group um, called community members. And you can become a community member by going to this website, ample.com community, and supporting the platform and us directly for $3 a month or whatever you'd want above that. And this is our way of aligning accountability with our community rather than VC investors. So when you become a community member, you can get a seat at the table. This means you can run for our board of directors or vote for the, in the board elections. You can have decision-making power. So important co-op decisions will actually go by you and you will be able to sub uh, submit your ideas as proposals. You'll get insider access, which means you can unlock content that we're posting on this page, which will give uh, insights to people and operations on Ampled, and we'll post polls to get feedback on key strategic decisions. And you'll get access to the team so you can join our Slack and join in our everyday conversation. So again, I want to invite you to become a community member. Um, we're helping make music more equitable for artists. And beyond that, we are hoping to also do something better, which is by aligning the co-op model with the scale of the web to generate a reshaping of corporate governance and human organization that we haven't really seen before. And we want to invite you to become a part of that and help build it together. So thank you. Good to connect again. Yeah, yeah. My hemispheric twin. If you don't mind, I will give you a, a little uh, intro. Tyson is one of my favorite people. He and I just had so much fun in our various interactions on my podcast. He's an academic at Deakin University. He's a research fellow in indigenous knowledge. I first came across him from his book, Sand Talk, How Indigenous Thinking 
can save the world. At the time I read it, I went on Twitter and said, this is the most interesting book I have read in the last two years. And it's been about two years since I read it. And I think it's now the most interesting book I've read in the last four years. Folks, if you haven't read uh, Sand Talk yet, go read it. It's just the most amazing combination of serious thinking from a complexity perspective, from an indigenous perspective, and it's a beautiful work of art. You know, how often do you get to say that about a, a, a serious book of ideas that it's also uh, a great work of art? So that's, uh, that's Tyson. Uh, I'm Jim Rutt. I'm a podcaster uh, at the Jim Rutt Show, jimruttshow.com. I'm a retired business dude. I did uh, help sort of build the internet, internet kind of thing all the way back to the ancient pre-internet worlds of 1980. Uh, I'm also a former chairman of the Santa Fe Institute. We like, like to think of ourselves as the uh, home of complexity science. And I'm one of the startup gang for something called Game B, which is a uh, new way of thinking about social operating systems for the world that can lead us to a, a truly sustainable yet interesting and good pathway for humanity towards the future. You want to learn more about Game B? Uh, go to game-b.org. Uh, they'll ask you a few questions. Just say, Jim Rutt sent you, uh, and they'll let you in. Uh, it's, it's, still, it's currently a, a somewhat controlled uh, website, but if you, if you hear me, uh, you can go there at game-b.org. So anyway, that's us. So Tyson, what have you been up to? Too much. I'm, I'm preparing for a writing retreat. I'm going to write Sand Talk 2. Uh. The, the, w the working title is um, 12 Ways to Avoid Lists in the Anthropocene. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I love that. It's good. Uh, so Self-referential. I'm, 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 I'm just going to completely... Ah, I've, I've, I've started a, a, war on, um, a war on personal development. I'm, I'm just I'm sick of all this self-help. Sick of all these books. It's like 10 things you can do to stop climate change. Eight things that you can do to make yourself smarter and, and all this kind of thing. I'm like, ah. Oh. How about the one, how about the ones even better? Pure clickbait. Fifteen pictures of movie stars of the past that you won't believe, right? Uh, it's you know, it's kind of like that. Yeah, crap it's like that. It's kind of like that. Yeah. Well, anyway, that's, that's my working title. So I, I'm going to try and break my record, and, and I'm going to write this one in five days. That's my that's my goal. I'm going to go 24 seven for five days. Is it going to be the mix of you know the personal and the ideas like Sand Talk One? Uh, yeah, and, and just all the yarn. You know, you propelled me into a world of people who, who are talking about amazing things. So I guess we'll be getting into that today. And I've just had all these yarns with all these people, so I want to sort of put them all together, all the ideas coming out. Uh, you know, speaking of yarns, I do want to uh, just go back and, uh, and sort of wrap up one of our long-running yarns, which is uh, Mr. Emu. In uh, Sand Talk, Mr. Emu is one of the characters, right? One of the spirits of the origins of the world. Why don't you, uh, you know, give a, a little bit of rap about Mr. Emu, and then I'll uh, yeah. tell, uh, tell my side well, of the we, story, and I'll give you the final, we, uh, the final denouement as far as I know it. We talked a lot about Emu, you know, because the, in that sort of dreaming story we were looking at there from Western Australia in the book, this Emu is, is a narcissist. He's uh, what they call a katwara, crazy, and, and so wait, she's running round and round. And this was at a meeting where all the species were sitting around trying to decide which species would become the carers for everything. What I refer to as the custodial species, which was best suited to doing it. And it was the human animal that run, won the right to do that in the end. But the emu didn't like that much. He was running all around the place, kicking up dust, saying, look how fast I can run. I should be the boss of all this. It took everybody in the end to hold him down. He's a, he's a big dark shape in the Milky Way, a seasonally that comes up. And, and sort of in that season, when that story is alive and that ceremony is being done, you know, you've got the kangaroo there with the, his head as the Southern Cross. And you've got the, the uh, echidna there and... Uh, you've got the rainbow serpent is coiled around the emu's legs. You've basically got everybody just suppressing this narcissist because, um, you know, controlling the excesses of sociopaths, etc., is a team sport. It does take everybody <laughs> to get that done. With Jim's general sort of disdain and, and sort of perplexed feelings about, you know, this kind of 
the weird sort of woke uh, stuff that's happening in the world and the, everything else from QAnon to, um, you know, all the weird panics and strange things happening in the world and all the everything going out of control. We, we've talked a lot about narcissism and talked a lot about emus uh, in all our discussions about, you know, humans as a custodial species. Yeah, then uh, yeah, in our Game B world, we often uh, talk about the danger of narcissists and sociopaths. And that one yeah. of the most fucked up things about game A is that it is an attractor for, I mean, there's just these handles of power sitting out there waiting for narcissists and sociopaths to grab them, right? And yeah. uh, and, and this is one of the things that we talk about uh, a whole lot. Yeah, and we're trying to figure out well, what's the main difference between pattern thinking and patternicity, which there's a big difference. And, you know, in, and we're going into the Aboriginal tradition of... Um, of of including that that seeing signs signs strange signs in the landscape and and phenomena around that uh you know that that's part of our triangulation you know in our method of inquiry there's there's signs that you follow and so you know jim's like you know you mentioned spirit and i get my gun but we like uh I've never talked about spirit more th with anyone else than with you which is so weird because we always end up going there and, you know, so we talked a lot about emu spirit. And then there was a sign <laughs> in Appalachia. I'm a, I live on a farm deep in the Appalachian Mountains in the lowest population density county east of the Mississippi River. Riding in uh, on one of our fields on the left on the way into our farmhouse, what should be in the field but would look like a wild turkey only about six feet tall. And they go, what? Uh, sure enough, there's an emu on our farm. An emu, big, gigantic, ostrich-like bird, uh, not as long a neck, big and huge, and it was beautiful, had a colorful feather tail, very healthy. Its tail feathers were bouncing as it walked along, called a Mr. Emu. Uh, you know, it was at our farm for about four weeks. Uh, at one field or another, it would get into fights with the deer and run them off. Uh, the deer did not like the emu, but the emu liked the deer. And we, just, uh, we believe that the emu was eating uh, the deer droppings. So as yeah, I said, he was around for quite a week. Came, would come start coming by our house even pretty close. We had a uh, you know, moderate snow, maybe 15 centimeters of snow on the ground, and it was fairly cold. And, Last thing we saw was Mr. Emu stalking by, walking in his kind of German goose-stepping style. And behind our farm is about 6,500 hectares of state game land. So it's kind of wild wilderness back in there, uh, though there are some fields. And uh, we saw Mr. Emu heading off into the bush. I wonder what that means. And we didn't ever saw him again, and nobody else ever heard from him again. So that was the end of the story. And so I guess the final update is... In the end, he disappeared into the bush. Well, yeah, he just disappeared. He went into the spirit well, Jim. Uh, nah, so so Jim, uh, portal, Jim sends me a photo. Jim sends me a photo of this emu and says, what does it mean? What does it mean? <laughs> <laughs> so in the yeah. updates, apart from he just went, disappeared. Nope. I don't Nothing. Think, I don't think we've talked since then, but... Uh, I have taken up regular meditation, something I've never done. People say, well, what are you trying to get out of meditation? I say, well, I want to learn how to fly, and I want to be able to point my finger at people and make them uh, keel over dead. And so far, I haven't been able to accomplish either one. But, you know, as, as people who know me know, I am a uh, pretty hardcore realist, and I'm, or I remain skeptical, though in, interested in inquiring about the spirit world. I'm always interested in... Uh, in your thoughts about these things. So, you know, can you put a, a, a yarn or a tail around Mr. Emu heading out into the deep bush? These, see, these things take a, we, we got real slow tech around this. this these are all psychotechnologies for us, uh, story and ritual and ceremony and all these things. It, it happens collectively in groups over a very long time. So yeah, you can't do it uh, unilaterally and you can't just you can't do it quickly. It's uh, it's slow tech this one, unfortunately. Well, think once you ponder on it. You look into the into the fire late at night, and I think that's that's going that's going somewhere. I mean, this uh, uh, indigenous knowledge systems lab that we started up this year at Deakin. One of the fellows there, fellows, senior fellows, um, you know, we were doing some writing together. Yeah, we were doing our take on scale, 
and we were going deep into all the lore and getting to scale and all that sort of thing. We ended up in this part of how the, how the new stories get done. Because we know the old stories, but then there's new stories as well. And so as I'm typing about that, he starts clapping these boomerangs together. And, and he starts singing this song. It was a song cycle from Ritual. And it was about, uh, it's only a hundred years old, this song. And it happened uh, when they started planting out the cane fields and just killing all that land with all the cane fields there. But then there was a cane beetle. So they introduced the cane toad to eat the cane beetle, but he didn't eat the beetle. He took off everywhere else. And you know, the cane toad has the poison sack. So it started poisoning water holes and all these animals were dying and all that sort of thing. And, um, you know, so part of bringing it into that system was making a dreaming for it. And so they did a song cycle and he was singing that song for me, clap, clap, singing that song in his language. And, um, yeah, so we were, I was writing like that. So these new stories come through like that, but it takes a, it takes a long time for, uh, for it to happen. Uh, cause it's, it's basically you're singing the entire system and how the cane toads are going to come in and fit within the system now. So it was kind of like part of it was about teaching the crows, you know, to flip them over and eat the, eat the belly and avoid the poison sacks. And it was, you know, trying to convince all of the goannas not to eat <laughs> the cane toads because it was killing them. And, um, you know, all the land management things for keeping the toads out of the waterways and all that kind of thing. But yeah, that, that ritual technology, that's, it's, it's slow tech. It takes a long time and a lot of minds working on it at once. Some things can't be, uh, can't be hur hurried. Yeah. That's nine things to learn about Jim Rutt's emu. You know? <laughs> all right, we'll give I can get that we'll out. I can get that out in a blog in like 10 minutes. Yeah, we'll yeah. let it percolate. We'll let it percolate when the when the ideas come. The ideas come. Well, let's move on here to some of the topics they wanted us to talk about. First one you already mentioned. In fact, it was uh, my number one takeaway from Sand Talk, which it's an idea which I have just flat out stolen, though I do give credit. And that is this idea of humans as custodial species. This is huge to my mind. Right in rut speak, humans are the first general intelligence. The first species that can sort of do almost anything, giving, giving us enough time. Of course, uh, we don't have wisdom yet, so we have the power of gods without the wisdom of gods, which is a little scary. Since we are the first over the line, we can make or break our planet. Tyson's idea is that we are the custodians, the janitors of our planet. Uh, we are now responsible for the care and well-being of our planet. This, to my, my mind, is a huge idea, and if this were to ever become culturally current, we might actually survive as a species. If it doesn't, we may well not. Well, we need to remove the idea of intellectual property from it then first, because if that's just, as I believe, is if that's our ecological niche, then you can't exactly put a patent on that. You can't be citing people every time you like mention the ecological niche of the, you know, I'm an organism in this species, but I can't say what it is that I do because Tyson said it first. Yeah, you have to send a nickel to Tyson I've got, every time you yeah. say custodial species, right? <laughs> <laughs> I want a dollar every time somebody looks after the land. Anyway, look, uh, yeah, that's our ecological niche. Our ecological niche is that we can um, walk alongside all of the other niches. You know, we, we, we have the capacity to see and be across entire systems and to guide these things. And, um, and you know, when there are changes and upheavals, you know, actually help uh, keep moving things towards, you know, some kind of homeostasis. Things go wrong, which they do quite regularly. We, we've been through a lot of apocalypses as human beings. Uh, just on this continent here, we've been through about 12 of them. You know, we've had heaps of apocalypses. It's, um, they happen all the time. Hey, it's it's not a big deal. Apocalypse is part of how things work. It's impressive that the you know, uh, Aboriginal people of Australia have been living for what, what do they figure fifty fifty five thousand years or so in in more or less one place. At least what I've read, the Aboriginal people uh, have been quite active in managing the landscape. In fact, I, I saw a quite interesting article that said that uh, uh, the Australian uh, folk. Uh, maybe the uh, society, one, uh, the, the step closest uh, society closest to modern in terms of its energy utilization, and it, but it's all in one thing, which is the fire forming of the environment. The Aboriginal folks have been using fire in a major way to uh, to groom the landscape for both uh, nature and human. 
Yeah, and it's it's very um it's very complex because you can't just burn everywhere all at once. You know, you've got to be very careful. It's um ends up being a mosaic pattern and you don't burn it in the same place twice, you know, uh within one cycle, you know. It depends on the soil, like is it a light soil that reflects heat? Is it a dark soil that absorbs heat? What's the seed bank doing? What kind of smoke does it need? What kind of fire does it need? Um, you know, so you do cool burns, you do hot burns, all different kinds, uh, depending on what you need to do in those places uh, to care for the landscape. But it's it's really complicated. There is a Fire Sticks Alliance that's doing some good work at making sure that everybody recovers that knowledge all over the continent now. And um, you know, you got lots of communities that are that are able to uh, take up this practice again. Which is good because it, uh, when you do that, it actually sequesters more carbon uh, than it burns. Um, you know, with uh, the growth that it stimulates. And you know, we're not the only ones to do it. I was talking to a Dutchman recently, Jim. He he had that from his uh, great grandfather, the burning practices, and that's that uh, salamander story. You know that uh, that mythology of the salamander it can't be burnt by fire. By fire. Yeah, yeah. Fire. He was right? saying he's saying no, no, that's a that's a seasonal. That's a seasonal indicator. Their story is to tell you when to burn uh, heather, you know, because you got to burn all the heather and, and and there's all this weird stuff that goes on with the birds that lay their eggs. It's got to be in the right season, not when they're nesting, and it's got to clear it out. But after the pH has been increased by the all the dung from the baby birds, and then the the ash sort of you know it settles down the pH again. There's all this balanced stuff that happens, but you've got to burn it at exactly the right time when you see these flowers appear and these insects appear. That's the sign to burn, because when you burn it, then that's the signal for the salamanders to come up out of the ground from hibernation. And because they're not burning anymore, the salamander population's low low now, because humans have always there been in that ecological niche. You know, there's a symbiosis there now because the humans burn the land at that time in that season. And that's the signal for them to come up. And now they're not all coming up. A lot of them are staying under the ground and they die down there now. So the numbers have gone down. You know, so he's, he starts burning off at the right time. And then the salamanders come back there. And then those birds that are now extinct, you know, there's still heaps of them in Sweden. He reckons that they see the smoke or smell the smoke and so those birds have come back in yeah they're reintroducing wolves in there all kinds of things it's amazing anyway um so you know this is something that all human this is a human thing most of the things that people sort of see as you know exotic uh, indigenous you know primitive ancient or whatever word you want to put you know this is things that uh, people were doing up until very recently so this man, Michel Grubay, his great-grandfather was burning the land in that way when he was a kid. <laughs> yeah, so it wasn't that, lo wasn't that long ago that, you know, this is something that most humans are doing. Now, they still do it here in the U.S. Uh, for uh, pest control purposes in certain kinds of environments. Uh, you know, if the, what the insects get out of control, you burn off a field and... Uh, it'll come back, you know, just as well or better, gets rid of weeds, etc. I think one of the things that's really important, and I've heard you talk about this uh, before, is that these kinds of cultures, whether they're the Dutchmen or whether they're the, uh, you know, your Appalach clan, they live in high context. Right? There's a, a tremendous amount of nuance as you were starting to relate. You know, this relates to that, that relates to this. And if you don't understand the whole pattern, you know, you're like a bull in a china shop. What is industrial agriculture where you plant by the calendar, irrespective of the weather or anything else, but kind of a low context way to sort of hammering the world with a hammer. Maybe you could uh, uh, yarn on a bit about the idea of high context and low context. That's a pretty basic version of it. There are, I mean, there's of course better, well, you've read the, um, what's his name? The one who wrote the weird, weirdest people on earth. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Joe Henrik. He 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 Henrik. Yeah. Yeah, we had him on great, the podcast. Great book. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So he has um he's got a really good summary of all the research that's been done around that kind of thing, you know, over the last few decades. There are but the the kind of pop science, you know, way to talk about it, which is let's face it, that's what I do. It's um no, it's not pop science, it's more like hipster science. I think is my market niche. In that one, you know, the the best way to talk to people about it is high context and low context cultures. You know, so high context cultures, you are, um, you know, it's, you're basically doing systems thinking, 
you know, so they do that classic test, and he talks about it in his book. You know, you show a kid a, a picture of, of a duck in a pond, and like, you know, some kids from, some, from most cultures in the earth, um, a lot of kids are going to look at that and go, ah, oh, yeah, well, it's a pond, and it's winter, and, uh, you know, it's, 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 it's in a forest, you know, and it's, yeah, it's uh, this time of day, and there's a duck in there. And that's high context. Whereas, like, uh, you more weird kids with the, you know, Western educated, industrialized, rich, democratic, you know, they tend to call those cultures more low context because those are the kids who'll go, that's a picture of a duck. Next! Okay. Show me the next picture! I want to get as many of these right as I can in five minutes! So that's, uh, that's your low context, um, <laughs> you know, culture. But really, it's not really a culture. It's an economic system. It's a... Um, it's a sort of a labor market. It's a, an educational institution thing. You know, that's, you know, anybody who, you know, really, really goes through that. And you, you can't call it a Western education. It's more of a, I don't know, liberal education or what is it? It's everywhere on the planet now. Anyone who goes through it will end up with um, a lower context kind of reasoning. That's all the weird stuff that came out of, like, uh, you know, Germany and Prussia and, you know, all around that area in the, you know, from the 1700s to right up until the start of the 1900s it was all really weird stuff going on there with experiments you know and, and they put together that uh, sister education system there uh, that public education system you know and they put it together based on animal husbandry techniques you know this is how you tame a wild animal you know you lock up the young in the daylight hours away from their parents you uh, give them a little stimulation very little stimulation in confined space and you get them to perform useless tasks, purposeless tasks with uh, using rewards and punishments. And you'll end up with a good domesticated, stupid, fat, compliant sort of being a very low context kind of <laughs> animal. You know, um, and all of the education stuff that came out of there was weird. And it was, it was all mixed in with, at the same time, this weird longing for a kind of a return to some kind of wild state that have been lost this romanticization of um you know or this exoticization of other cultures eastern cultures it's kind of a it might have been a hangover from the ancient greeks they were obsessed with the hyperboreans you know they like made up this culture and they were like doing ethnographies of the celts and going oh this is such a noble savage you know with the perfect civilization and it's good to study them to remember what it is to be you know, a perfect human, we can aspire towards that. So anyway, all that weird stuff, you know, came through, you know, around the sort of Germanic regions over that, over that sort of long period. You ended up with all these middle-class kids becoming wonder vogels and, and roaming the countryside, like plundering the cultures of peasants, you know, to try and find something authentic. And, and, and then they're all doing seances. You remember that stuff? Right up to the 1920s, they're all doing seances and, and weird stuff and sex parties and, and, they're, and they're taking fly garrick mushrooms and they're like, um, you know, they're all wearing turbans and shit. They're everywhere. Every other guy had a fez. <laughs> you know, they were doing all that weird stuff. And Madame Blavatsky was out there and she was like, you know, like a spirit medium channeling, writing all these massive volumes of books about, oh, there's this lost Aryan race. You know, um, you know, and and the Jews are no good. The Jews are kind of evil, and and then there's all these sort of lower races over here, and you know, she's like spirit riding all this sort of stuff, and then everybody was into it. Hitler was into it. Gandhi was into it. You know, um, the whole anthroposophy sort of thing came out of people who were going nuts over her writings and having sex parties and and seances in in weird weird Victorian mansions back in the day. And so, you know, you ended up with all this uh, sort of weird alternative education coming out at the same time and all these weird philosophies. Um, oh, there, there, there was some strangeness coming out of that region. Yeah, it's interesting. The, uh, you know, the way I like to think about it is that we're in this, uh, the, the modern Western culture is in a, a pretty schizophrenic state. And then on one side, you have uh, this rigid money on money return sausage factory school system uh, called the John Dewey thread, which is you know, squeezes the juice out of everything and prepares people to work on an assembly line, tightening a bolt. Now those jobs have long since uh, gone to China. And so we've uh, kind of left our people badly prepared for the modern world in any case. 
But even in, in the days when it, when it was perhaps economically appropriate, it certainly did not build a complete person. Uh, on the other hand, you have, you know, screwball stuff. You know, as you say, people just make up wacky stuff, right? The, the Rudolf Steiners and people of that sort. You know, at, at some level, uh, I, I, think, I think from a philosoph philosophical and history of ideas, you can say a lot of this is, rom is the romanticism, the romantic uh, uh, rejection or reaction against the Enlightenment tradition. And it's people kind of just making it, making something up and pillaging ideas from around the world and, you know, wishing the world were a certain way and acting as if maybe it was. And Are you coming across the odd car carpetbagger popping up in, because I'm coming across them here and there in the complexity, game B, you know, sense making, you know, all of that sort of milieu. You get, you get these, these ones pop up from time to time who are doing that. It's like they have a hypothesis. They sort of get excited about it and, and sort of weave it together and connect it to as many disciplines and things as possible. They put together a bunch of really good memes and then they launch. You know, they haven't done the work of, of actually trying to form it into any kind of theory. I think I've just described what I'm doing <laughs> in a weird way. And sort of, they offer, you know, they, like they offer a... Um, you know, here's this critique of, of the, the, the civilization where it is, and it's terrible. It's all, you know, it was better at some stage, and now it's terrible. And, and now, you know, we're going to make the new thing. And, and here's, here's my 12-step list to fixing that. You know what I mean? And they sell that, and they, then they get all, and it's all gurus, and there's people following them, and there's people defending them and attacking them, and it's just this big swirling mess of, of, of shit. Have you... Have you come across any, have you noticed any of that around? Oh, for sure. Because I've something. seen at least at least a dozen of them out there doing that. You know, this yeah, is, one it's, just, one it's not like, showed up the other you know, day, right? Uh, it I, didn't I, I, end I, I, in the 19, 1940s or anything or the 1960s. That, that's kept going. It's, it's escalated, if anything. You know, I think the sign, for me at least, of, uh, of that tendency, which those people's hearts sometimes are in the right place, uh, but uh, they're... Uh, they're, they're what I call right-only devices. They want to tell you about what their grand scheme is, when in reality, uh, at least my thinking, is that this is a joint exploration together, a community, a large community of people who are trying different things, communicating honestly with each other, horizontally, acknowledging what, what doesn't work, uh, replicating what does work. This is an experiment in how we make it to the future. We don't know. Anyone tells you they got the answer. That's the community. But, you, you know, it, that community is an attractor. It's a basin of attraction for carpetbaggers, snake oil salesmen. Yeah, yeah, they come in and they're like, they pick off the weak ones around the edges of the herd. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's why you need a few old bulls, right? Like, yeah, yeah. yeah. Who, right? Put our heads yeah. down. And go, All right, motherfucker, get out of Dodge. Yeah, we need to. We got you, you in the, the wrong spot. Horn. You shouldn't be at the center of this. Th you know what? You know what we need to do. We need to deploy all the Stoics. We need to get the Stoics to form a perimeter. Get that semi-permeable membrane happening there. Get all the Stoics around the perimeter. Just just checking people as they come in. Just see what's in the carpet bag first. Uh, it's really hard to bullshit a Stoic, right? <laughs> That's one of the great things about them, right? <laughs> it is because they'll just accept it. Mm -hmm. There you go. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, the other person I like a lot in that regard is Jamie Wheel. He's quite the opposite. Of oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. But he, uh, he's done a lot of interesting thinking about uh, you know, what, what, is, what is cultishness. And he has his, uh, you know, sort of anti-cult checklists, which uh, yeah. I encourage pe people to look at. Because it is unfortunate that, uh, you know, trying to do the work to collaboratively, to, well, try that again, collaboratively build a communication for evolving what comes next uh, is unfortunately fertile ground for certain kinds of uh, cult leaders. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and many of them are narcissists and or sociopaths. And this is where, yeah. what, you know, a good solid culture needs to have deep immune systems against those, those takeovers. You know, one of my favorite writers on this is uh, Chris Boehm. He wrote a book called Hierarchy in the Forest. He makes the point that despite the fact that we're related to two uh, rather hierarchical species, bonobos and chimps, uh, humans in their forager days uh, were anti 
a hierarchical. In fact, his book really should have been called Anti-Hierarchy in the Forest. And mm. uh, these folk uh, had many cases, uh, cultural ways, folk ways, uh, that laughed at the guys who wanted to think they were the big man. And then they would just ignore them and not, you know, they told me, okay, the big man tells me what to do. I just don't do it, right? And if he tries to get a couple of his buddies to enforce his will, well, guess what? Maybe uh, five of us will come up and kill him in the night. So there was this 100,000-year-long uh, way of being uh, where a social operating system at the band level had evolved and spread across much of the world. Yeah, uh, we, that, we, we don't uh, like buses. Yeah, yeah, basically anti-boss. Like yeah, we're yeah. inherently uh, egalitarian, but this only seems to work uh, at the Dunbar number, you know, 150 people or less. And, mm. you know, one, question, one of the big questions in our Game B thinking is how do you scale that up uh, mm. if you can? You know, now my own thought is that maybe you can't in some big sense, but so rather you build society from the smaller building blocks, right? If the, if the building blocks are 150 and smaller, then you can use the forager ways of keeping bosses in check. Uh, and if we, if we don't let the bosses arise at the forager, at the, you know, the 150, the Dunbar level, uh, then there's no place for them to, you know, gather their first bits of power to move on up the, uh, on up the chain. What are your thoughts about that? It's just cooperatives of cooperatives basically is is how it's always worked here uh that's how it's worked under our sort of uh continental common law in a way that's been able to maintain you know all the linguistic diversity in this part of the world the sign of imperialism having occurred is you've got a massive nation where everyone speaks the same language and th th that's how you know that you you've had like uh, destructive warfare and multipolar traps going on for ages uh, but somehow Australia has managed to maintain like uh, if you ever see an Aboriginal languages map of Australia it's like you know it's like 500 you know little pieces little quilt pieces on a big quilt you know so we managed to maintain that and it's quite simply through that um, you know um, fractal scaling you know so it's basically you know you as a person as a sovereign self-determining person you are nobody can boss you but you're bound within these relations with these within these re re like relationships and um sort of you know fairly strict relational protocols so that's your check and balance you know to that you are networked if you like so you've got this 150 people where that can work everybody everything is um everything is transparent you know, everybody knows what everybody's doing, so no one can get away with being, you know, a complete asshole or, you know, trying to boss people around or anything like that. That works in that unit. But then that scales up, you know, when, with, when you've got that 150 people there, they have a relationship with this 150 people over here. And then this, you know, so you get all those groups end up networked together in the same pattern as the individuals are networked within the original Dunbar. You know, and it keeps scaling up like that. So you have, you know, your, your clans, your tribes, and then it goes, it scales up to big regional groups. Like we have big regional collections of many tribes, you know, dozens, you know, or even like a, a hundred tribes, you know, sort of come together under Kuris or Murrays or Nangas, Nyungas, Bamas, you know, all, all these different kind of, uh, you know, um, big law categories there. And then those all network together. And so there's, um, you know, big ceremony and ritual where every, where people have to travel sometimes thousands of miles, you know, on regular cycles, you know, to come together to cement these relationships, to keep the trade going, to adopt each other's children, you know, marry across into the different groups. This is, um, you know, this kind of embassy and trade's been going on forever. And you kind of, yeah, you kind of need to do it like that. You need to maintain that diversity all these little bioregional sort of groups, you know, who are unique and defined by the law of their land, the spirit of their bioregion, and then that kind of just scales up and syndicates. I, I like the idea of, uh, I think it's so important. Uh, I love the fact that you highlight, you know when the settlers have come, when everybody speaks the same language, right? And, and also, by the way, the houses look the same, the clothes look the same, the food is the same, right? When in re re reality, nature is fractal and rich and local and emergent around local context. Uh, you, know, you know, even more wild than the, the uh, Australian Aboriginal language map is the New Guinea language map, much smaller, 
1,500 languages in, the, in, New, in New Guinea. And those were there for about as long as Australia. I mean, that's, again, 45,000, 50,000 year old cultures. That's, that's huge. Well, I was, we, we were talking the other night, me and Dave Snowden were talking to a fellow from Papua. We were in, I don't know, some panel we were on together, webinar. And yeah, we were talking to Merv Wilkinson from Papua and he was, yeah, he was talking about the same thing. And he was talking about, talking about that system of laws that they've always had there. And, but he's actually, you know, he's a, a sort of a big corporate consultant now, this fella, because he takes those uh, messages and those ideas and, you know, and um, basically takes them in to make your organization sort of more effective and agile, which is pretty cool. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I know what I've read, but I've never actually spoken to Papan, and I'd love to learn more about that because, again, it's uh, uh, you know, coherent pluralism uh, in the mo almost most yeah. extreme form imaginable. It's been uh, meta-stable. I mean, they constantly they've constantly warred with each other, but on the other hand, they've married across, and it, it's this very yeah. interesting dynamic meta-operating system that operates at multiple levels. Well, like that's that's the that's the weird thing that so so me and Dave Snowden are doing a we're doing a kind of an embassy b between like Indigenous Wales and Indigenous Australia, and then on each subsequent webinar we bring in Indigenous people from other places, and we just talk complexity. It's <laughs> it's pretty exciting. So we we did um, identity and economics last week, and it was just really cool to have a Papuan man's um you know take on that. A Papuan uh, management consultant. Now, there's a concept for you. Uh, yeah, that's it. I'd like to you know, turn back a little bit to you talked about this uh, fractal uh, organization uh, of peoples from you know, Dunbar numbers. And of course, Dun you know, I had Dunbar on my uh, podcast recently, and you know, he, he makes the point that there, there isn't just one Dunbar number at 150, there's also smaller numbers, also 50, 15, 5, and one and a half, you know. Uh, yeah, which I thought was a hilarious idea. On the upside, going to the larger scale, in the uh, Australian indigenous traditions, how are decisions made at those higher levels? Is it democracy? Is it consensus? Is it something entirely different? It's weird because you're not the only, you don't consider yourselves to be the only sentient minds there. You know, so you're, everything you do is within a, a, the landscape. Uh, the governance system's not separated from a landscape that's considered sentient. Uh, the economic system's not separate from the landscape that's considered sentient. Um, you know, there are a thousand signs at, at any given time, you know, what the ants are doing, how the ants are moving and what they're doing, what colored rocks they're putting on their nests. They're not just, they're not superstitious signs. They're things that'll tell you about weather events coming. The land makes it clear where you're supposed to move on to. <laughs> you know, so basically it's everybody's sort of out there, you know, collecting data uh, in the landscape and then coming together and having the big yarns, you know, where everybody, you know, shares the data that they have from their movements in the landscape. And that picture forms, you know, pretty much an obvious, an obvious pattern of what you're supposed to do, to do next. It's like, well, we're going to have to move to the coast you know, to follow that mullet run. That'll be, you know, the elders who have authority, but not power because power is distributed throughout the group. The elders who have authority, you know, they might pipe up and say, yeah, but you're not looking at that cloud over there. Uh, you might want to wait a couple of weeks for that mullet run. And I'm worried about these signs. There might be a red tide. So maybe we'll move away from the coast. This, You know what I mean? The elders have that authority of long experience. So people will listen to them. But at the same time, you know, the decisions are sort of made collectively, but in a weird way with, you know, human and non-human intelligence uh, operating together. Because you are part of the system and the system is moving you as much as you are caring for it. This idea, uh, again, this idea of the custodial species kind of goes both ways, right? Not only do we take care of uh, uh, the natural world, but the natural world tells us things that are useful. Now, is, is each member of uh, the culture uh, equally skilled at reading nature, or are there specialists who, uh, through long experience or personal characteristics, are generally perceived by other folks as better at reading the signs? How does that communication, uh, how is it modulated between coming back from nature into the human system? Every 10-year-old kid's got a PhD in biology, you know, basically. 
there's you know so there's that basic knowledge that sort of kindergarten level knowledge which is about where i where i am <laughs> but then there's there is specialized knowledge um so you your family group or a particular line in your family will have a, a totemic relation to very particular things jim you might be around you know emu and then you know this kind of substance uh this kind of season um, and this other kind of tree over here that might be the totemic group of entities that you understand best and there'll be big story for that and you'll carry all the law and all the songs for all the systems that come out of that symbiotic relation between those things that season those animals those those plants and that will be your thing and so when people want to approach that place or you know they want to do something involving any of those species they'll ask you and you'll let them know if it's the right time when you can do it and when it's not and so then you have this dynamic subordination for decision making because as your entire group is moving through the landscape you're moving through different places where different members have the best knowledge and anything new that comes in so any new inventions or any new species that might come in so the cane toad song i mentioned earlier that will find a place so it has to it has to find somewhere in the moiety division so it has to find a side, you know, whether it's light blood or heavier blood or however you delineate those things, you know, it'll, it'll be in this category or that category. And then it'll go into a particular clan and a particular family and that will come under there. They will have the song for that. There'll be a song cycle for that. So a song cycle for tobacco, for steel, uh, for the cane toad, like I said, for water buffalo, for pig. I know people who have um, uh, anchor and machete in their totemic system because there's song for that and ceremony for that because these are technologies that have come in you know there are some groups of elders who who are starting to put together song cycles for uh, you know moving towards things like ai and things like that which is getting really interesting you know it's not there yet because these things take time and there's a lot of information that's needed first i think the jewish golem story and i think frankenstein these are all origin origin myths for ai <laughs> <laughs> I think one of the great takeaways from that is that the, the system is open-ended, right? It, it can, in theory at least, deal with whatever turns up. An interesting issue that comes to mind, uh, you know, I recently had Heather Haying on the podcast and we talked about uh, oh, yeah. her book, Hunter Gatherers in the 21st Century. I think one of the main themes of the book is that the modern world and the you know, hyper-modern world is driving us to ever-escalating hyper-novelty. Something radically new every, you know, it was every generation. Now it seems like it's every four or five years. And, uh, you know, the metaverse is, uh, you know, the great hyped next great thing. We're all going to disappear into virtual reality. And if the clock times of this kind of natural human yarn-making, storytelling, song-weaving is generations, how the hell do we use our natural human capacity to make sense in this collective sense that you were alluding to in a world of hyper novelty? And I'm, you know, more and more starting to turn, you know, Mennonite. Uh, you know, the ruts originally were Mennonites way back yonder. And of course, I was one of the devils that helped build the Internet. So I'm part of the part of the problem here. But I'm starting to think that, uh, uh, you know, maybe we need to say, yo, slow down, yeah. people, because our sense yeah. making is just out of whack. It, it takes way longer to, you know, is Facebook a good idea or not? You know, it might take generations to figure that out. Uh, how the yeah. hell can we live in a world of hyper novelty using this kind of indigenous sense making that you're talking about? It's weird because it, it requires actual group identities. <laughs> <laughs> like actual group identities where there is a fluid self other boundary between you and the people in your family village group that's what that requires <laughs> but we don't have that because we're all fractured now with the sort of social fragmentation that's been part of you know neoliberalism over the last four decades everybody's just an individual now and so people's group identities are really just demographic profiles 
that sort of mark them as this fabulous identity or set of intersections or or whatever or or this no good one or you know this one that has privileges this one that doesn't this one that has ious that one that's supposed to pay the ious and doesn't want to <laughs> it's all these weird we're all hyper individualized and at the same time that kind of neoliberal framework it, it demands that we're constantly relentlessly self-improving because god forbid we should have a village or a family or god worse an employer or oh, even worse a state someone who's going to look after us and take care of, you know maybe provide us out no you got to be onto it all the time you got to manage yourself you've got to grow yourself you've got to grow your brand you're a little mini corporation under yourself i don't know i think that's the thing that that really I don't know that we connect on more than anything is that you and I are both people who could not give a shit about what our brand looks like. <laughs> you know what I'm going to like me fucking not, the horse you're not from, <laughs> not remotely <laughs> interested in personal <laughs> PR. I don't know, to our detriment, you know, in the marketplace, but then how interested are you in that? You know, I know you can basically, you know, you, you, you got a farm in the mountains, you're good. But yeah, it's 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 the endless, relentless PR and marketing. You know, originally that was something that was invented, you know, to control people, you know, by and for business and, and by and for the state. Um, it's this psychotechnology. It's invented to be able to, you know, manipulate people this way and that way. But then I guess, you know, with the technologies, the, the other communication technologies we have now, those tools are in everyone's hands. It's like this WMD. You know, everybody has, everybody's a little Edward Bernays. as we all got access to these, these terribly destructive tools that, you know, of, of PR and marketing, and we're all deploying it for our own brand. We're all relentlessly self-improving and doing all this personal development and bloody, you know, trying to self-actualize and self-actualize and gain that edge, you know, when it's, it's not in there. That's, you know, we're, oh, we're going to look inwards and really critically self-examine our stuff and take a big inventory. And then we're going to sit and, and bloody meditate into our navels and do a passion retreat. And then we're going to do this and we're going to do breath work. And we're going to, I'm going to become the best person I can be. <laughs> I'm Wim Hof here, breathing. I'm going to take a cold shower and I'm going to read this book. You know, I don't even read these books anymore. If I want to like find out what an author's, oh, I'll call the author. I'll talk to him myself. I don't know. It's just that's not where it is. It's it's in our relationships together. That's where the knowledge is. That's where the growth is. That's where the health is. And when you cut off from that, that's when you get poison. And that brings us back to the gurus. I I did have, I did have a list of all the things to be able to identify those 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 grifters you know and then and one of the and but but every time i get a, I start to get a list together you meet someone who you know, doesn't fit with the list that's why i'm they doing have new, an anti they have a new scam right i'm doing an anti-list thing oh you got someone like it used to be i said all right if they're selling supplements they're a fucking grifter <laughs> you know if they're selling a line of supplements they're a grifter but then i meet these awesome people who are actually doing they're selling some they're selling some pretty cool supplements and they're, and they're good people and i'm like ah oh, okay well they're not gurus and they're doing supplements and they're kind of all right so that that doesn't fit anymore you, you, just avoid heuristics you know you never use a heuristic for longer than 10 minutes you know if you need it for longer than 10 minutes you're no longer being responsive to your context be aware of your context and responsive to it that shit shifts really quick if you're stuck in a heuristic, which is, you know, sometimes a good mental tool and will help you out with a bit of heavy lifting, I don't know, don't get married to it. Heuristics are central. I mean, the world is way too high order complex to actually think it through algorithmically. We need heuristics, rules of thumb, but we need to be, con and this is where high context, this idea, the fact that you're in, uh, sincerely engaged with your world in a face-to-face, -face, toes in the soil kind of way, and you're getting feedback from the land and your posse, right? 
Uh, you know, and this is where we hope to be going with our Game B movement to proto bees, where we're creating communities on the ground of not more than 300 people. Rutt gets too full of himself. Uh, the, his face-to-face -face community is say, hey boy, you know, you're getting awful full of yourself. Your face-to-face -face community can tell you that. But on the other hand, someone tells me that on Twitter, I'm gonna get up in their, up in their grill, right? Uh, but, but somebody I hang out with, drink beer with, uh, you know, swap lies with, you know, they can tell me whatever the hell they want and I'm gonna take it seriously. Every time I think I've found like a piece of solid ground to stand on, so, you know, like uh, growth, you know, growth-based economic systems, you know, they're evil, no good. Um, you know, so does that make me a degrowth person? Like, oh, immediately I got to shift to that side. Straight away you get married to something, and, and I found myself in that trap. But that Catherine Collins got me out of it. That when I started to like binarize that growth and degrowth sort of thing and, and take a side, you know, on that, she got me out of it uh, with that thing she got in trouble for, you know, when she got a big drubbing for. It's on CNN or something, and she did that metaphor she does, where she goes, well, you know, you can gain 20 pounds because you're pregnant and it's wonderful, you know, but you can also gain 20 pounds from eating too much pizza. <laughs> and that's a metaphor for like whether growth is good or bad. But she made everyone mad because in the growth people were mad, the degrowth people were mad. Oh, and she's fat shaming. <laughs> and then there's people like, it's like, well, what am I, do I have a right to have a baby as well? You're talking about babies. What, and what about this, you know, and you're fat shaming people. Even, and we, I don't know. Me and Jimmy are going, well, as gentlemen of girth, we don't take any offense at that at all. I could eat kale and distilled water and live to be 112, but why? That's life, right? You make your choices, you, you, know, you pick your horse and you ride it. And, uh, and I have no regrets. I said, what else do we want to chat about here? Oh yeah, this is some talk about conviviality and on the ground society. Uh, and one of the things that I miss, uh, I was just a little too, uh, you know, probably a couple of generations too old for, but I know indigenous people have, you know, have held on to this a tremendous amount, are manhood and womanhood initiations and rites. You know, if you look at peoples throughout the world, they've been doing this for as long as, as history and prehistory uh, uh, records are, are available or, or archeological records. What can you tell us about uh, you know, your folk or, and folk related to your folk and, and how they think about the coming of age of a man and a woman and, and what does that mean and how's that done? So everybody like immediately thinks about the ordeal side of things, you know? You know and they're, yeah, they're us there's usually some kind of ordeal that you go through, you know, and that, that's part of a sequence, uh, you know, a pedagogical sequence to get you to a state to actually change your physical chemistry you know with a like a very carefully administered sort of shock you know to the system um so there is usually some kind of ordeal so a lot of people say women any woman who gives birth then she's going through a, a an initiation anyway just naturally and it's kind of true because she's going through an ordeal you know anybody who goes through an ordeal it does change them but the meaning making that's supposed to come after that is really, really important, you know, because without that teaching, without that sense making, meaning making that's quite collective, all that is is trauma. You know, ordeal just gives you trauma. I don't know, and, and everybody's got a different response to that. You know, I, I go real Nietzsche on, on, on my responses to trauma. <laughs> like I go full, <laughs> you know, I don't know. Um, full Genghis Khan bloody Conan the Barbarian responses to that I just Rah! that's my response and that's not a healthy response that's like a that's one of those things you do when you're a damaged person who can't make meaning of the things that's happened to him and so you know I guess your rites of passage are there to shepherd you through a kind of program of education that'll bring you into another way of being uh, so for young people it's there to make sure that um you know, their adolescence doesn't last for longer than, you know, a few months, you know, that you are actually chemically changed into being an adult. You know, you get one of these at about traditionally about every 15 years in your life. So you think about 14 or 15, you know, and then at age 30, then 45, there's, there's many stages, you know, to the point where you can see that people were living, 
you know, quite regularly people were living, you know, past 120, 130 years old because of all of the, the rites that there were, you know, and sequences and stages of initiation that continues into extreme elderhood. And at each time, the new knowledge requires a, 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 a rewiring of your biology. You know, in the same way, um, your brain gets rewired when you become literate. Like biologically, your brain actually measurably changes. Yeah, it's the same see, thing. Yeah, you can see parts of your yeah. brain that can now find letters and turn them into words, right? Yeah. And we were not biologically it. evolved for that. We were biologically evolved for oral language, but for written language, yeah. not, there's not a bit. That That's a Absolutely. completely trained skill. Oh, your, your facial recognition, that that that, uh, that has to migrate to the other hemisphere of your brain, the, the, the connective tissue in between the hemispheres thickens all these things happen when you become literate so if you imagine something as pretty mild as learning to read how that can hardwire you biologically if you imagine a big sequence of very structured you know very ancient sort of psychotechnologies that are designed to actually transform you at the chemical level at the biological level you know in in, in and these are this is not magic you know this is like we know what happens when you are you know, if I start, um, like, if I start, you know, mirroring your actions now, you know, a little bit, and I do the same facial expressions of you, I do personality memoring, you're going to feel good. Um, you know what I mean? And then if uh, I start clapping, and you start clapping at the same time, and then we start stomping at the same time, we start to feel that, and it doesn't work over Zoom. <laughs> the <Goddamn> time <laughs> lag. This has been studied as well, you know, scientifically, that um, our brains, like we recognize each other, ah, this person's like me, I'll do well here, and we're performing an action together in the same rhythm, same time, and then, but if you, there's this force multiplier that happens when you, when you scale that up, so that there's like 50, 100, 150, 500 people, you know, all gathering for the big initiation rites, they're all doing that at the same time, that does something to you. You it really transforms everybody there. It puts you in another state. So you got, and that's just the basic, just clapping together. So imagine, you know, these rites that I can't even mention. You know, all these sequences of rites that take place over weeks. Um, you know, with with a lot of endurance ordeals, but then you know, lots of group. You know, very very structured group activities and intensive learning, oral history. Um, uh, often you have to learn an entirely new language that's just a ritual language that's only used in that, <laughs> in that ceremony. So you've got like three days to learn that language. There's massive feats of intellectual prowess that you have to go through. Um, all of these things, it just completely rewires you to become uh, the person who's able to receive and to keep and to be a custodian of the knowledge that you're receiving. The bigger story for all of the things that you're looking after in the places you're looking after them. Um, and the way you're regulating, you know, those things and the movement of outsiders in those places. You have to be really across the entire system, you know. You have to, uh, there's, there's a lot that needs to happen for you to become that custodian. Yeah, th that's, it's really integral to things, that, that big ceremony. And it's separate ones for men and women. And it sounds like what it is is very strong experiences, carefully crafted with people who have knowledge of psychotechnologies, uh, but then again in high context. So it's as you say, it's totally distinct. If something like these initiations were to happen to you just randomly in a hotel room with your uncle, uh, you know, it would be abuse and traumatizing. But if it's in the context high context of the whole community and maybe even the meta community and as you say a special language and psychotechnology tools that have been refined over generations then it's the exact opposite right it's it's transformational and integrating but it's not about yourself because you know, basically what you're going through in that first stage of initiation is coming out of that childhood where you're the center of the world and suddenly getting that rude shock realizing that you're not special and it's awful. <laughs> it just and then, but then you start to realize, um, oh, but I'm part of something special. I belong. Part of a something. bigger story. This is yeah. the thing, right? This is the I thing. I belong it's so to black. something special, and that yeah. special needs me. You know, that's and that's where I am. I'm out in 
all of that that I belong to. And that's who I am. And that is unique because there isn't anybody who has that exact same unique patterning of relations that I have. That's my personality. That's my unique uh, fingerprint. You know, that's my that's my footprint in this world. Oh, that's beautiful. That's so different than the atomized person. Uh, you know, where we've given up. We know, as we like to say in the game B world, uh, we've swapped our face to face communities and our extended families for government and the market both of which are, you know, anonymous transactional machinery that have, has no context. It's low context. There's no richness. Uh, you know, we don't have our role in it really other than as a consumer or a taxpayer. You know, I love the way you describe the fact that, uh, yes, I'm no longer special, but then when I realize that I'm part of this bigger thing, I am special again in that, as you say, I have a unique, literally unique set of inputs, relationships with people, relationships with the land. And if I add this perspective into this larger stew as we all collectively try to make sense of it, I do have my, my own unique role to play, but it's, in, it's as a member of an orchestra, not as a soloist. I wrapped up a lot of the stuff, I don't know, kind of aggressively with, with all, all the, all the, um, you know, the ideas around education and personal development that came out of a particular era in around the Germanic sort of region at a particular time. And, you know, that the, these things need to be, you know, carefully handled and not because like, oh, that's racist or like, oh, that's sexist or that's not politically correct or anything like that. But because, you know, it, it's quite simply with anything that you look at from another era, you kind of like going, well, you know, so they got these things wrong. <laughs> You know what I mean? So, you know, what if they got, got that wrong, what else did they get wrong? Let's just handle this with care. Okay, I think that works well. I'll take the thumb knitting from Steiner and I'll take the <laughs> the play mats from Montessori. But if you end up finding yourself a devotee of something, like freaking have a good look at yourself. What are you doing being a devotee of something? Like just get in there and have a look at it and take what you need, take it back to your family and sort of move around like grow things together in your groups and membranes and protocols you have a yeah, semi-permeable membrane around your groups and your various groups hierarchically but don't let them be non-permeable let things in and out right that's it and, and say all right well those guys over there and uh, on the york peninsula of australia they figured out some interesting things uh, i'm not sure i like it all but i like these three or four things let's try it yeah. out here in our local membrane I talk about how, how awesome and convivial we are, but then we speared a bunch of Dutchmen and, and sent a few survivors home, and that triggered the formation of the world's first corporation, and we know how that ended up. Oh, yeah, yeah, you unintended know, consequences, so right? Yeah, ended up with the Dutch inventing finance, and they invented art speculation, and both of those things converged on, to create NFTs, so I'm claiming responsibility for that as well. We should never have speared... Never speared those Dutchmen 500 years ago. It's um, it's a terrible knock-on effects, butterfly effects coming out from that. Yeah, send Tyson five cents every time you say NFT, uh, since he uh, he owns that intellectual property. That's it. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> well, Tyson, uh, I think we're going to have to wrap it up here. Uh, as always, this has just been such a rich and open-ended conversation. Culture and creativity connect us. But sometimes we get locked out of big decisions about the culture of our own neighborhoods. That's why we built Culture Steak, a totally new way to choose the culture and creativity we want together. Culture Steak is all about showing how you feel. Rather than putting a check in a box, you allocate vibe credits. The more credits, the more positive the vibe. But here's the clever part. You can't allocate them evenly. That means you've got to show not just what you feel good about, but how good you feel about it too. 
and the feels don't stop there. Because as well as feeling kind of grey, you get to pick arts and activities for where you live. You'll feel more plugged in to your local culture and community. Find out how you can culture stake in your community by visiting culturestake.org. to stay it's your culture it's your call this is rxc voice an in-house radical exchange creation using quadratic voting that makes democratic decision making accessible participatory and fun I'm Divya. I work on technology and democracy, and I'm an associate political economist at Microsoft, a radical exchange researcher, a visiting scholar at the Ostrom Workshop, and a huge science fiction fan. So I'm deeply excited to bring to everyone this conversation with the wonderful Ted Chang. It was an incredible honor to speak with Ted, science fiction writer, philosopher, and one of my personal heroes for radical exchange. Ted has written some of the most beautifully, scientifically intricate, and philosophically interesting short stories of our time. And I'm not just saying that because they won basically every major science fiction award. Four Hugos, four Nebulas, four Locus Awards. This man has a gift. His stories navigate themes of language, technological determinism, human agency, and free will. You know, the easy stuff. We focus here on his more recent collection, Exhalation, and we also discuss his work, Stories of Your Life and Others, which contains the short story on which the critically acclaimed film Arrival is based. To me, Ted's stories show us the deeply human side of technology. And they allow us to imagine meaningful and very true futures beyond either techno-utopia or science fiction dystopia. I hope that we can bring Ted's level of clear vision and insight to all of our work at Radical Exchange and really herald in our new era of democracy. Science fiction can highlight the contingency of the present, the compatibilist argument for free will, thinking through process versus outcome orientations, the predictive power of fiction, and many, many other things. We cover all of this in this conversation, which left me with a feeling of possibility, 
that creating a new and better future, a new reality is within reach. I hope it does the same for you. Hello, Ted. It's wonderful to have you at the Radical Exchange Conference. Hi, Divya. Thanks for having me. I was thinking of starting with something I've heard you say that's really stuck with me and I think defines uh, a chunk of the work we do at Radical Exchange as well, which is that you know most fears about AI and, and perhaps most fears of technology in general are actually fears about capitalism. And I'd love to hear you expand on that. Do you think it's possible to extricate our technological imaginaries and narratives from capitalism? And how do you think kind of our art and stories and, and narratives can play a role in this? When we talk about, you know, fears of technology, most of the things that we are afraid of are not specific to the, are not, they're not intrinsic to the technology. They're mostly about how capitalism will use these technologies against us. When people talk about, say, oh, just like, will will these technologies put us out of work? You know, it's not that technology wants to put anyone out of work. It's that, you know, capitalism is trying to reduce costs, and that often means uh, replacing people with uh, something cheaper. It's not the technology that's the problem. It's it's capitalism that's the problem. I think it's very easy for us to confuse technology and capitalism and to conflate opposition to capitalism with opposition to technology. Those are not necessarily uh, the same thing. I mean, those are definitely not the same thing, and they don't have to be closely aligned. You know, so like one example of this that I think is uh, really instructive is that the way that we use the word Luddite, we typically nowadays use it to refer to someone who has unthinking antipathy toward technology and uh, someone who resists progress. What the actual historical Luddites wanted was something very different. They did not destroy machines just because they hated machines. They had a lot of different objectives. You know, they wanted their wages to increase along with the factory owner's profits. They wanted like worker pensions. They only destroyed the machines of uh, factory owners who were underpaying their workers. And they left alone the machines of factory owners who paid their workers well. So, you know, what the Luddites were actually looking for was economic justice. And I think that it's, you know, it's really uh, in interesting that, you know, we have taken the name of a movement for economic justice and turned it into a, a kind of slur, a way of, you know, uh, dismissing people as being unthinkingly anti-progress. It's a symptom of the way that um, we in our, you know, s society, we identify capitalism with progress, uh, greater profits with, with progress. You know, I think it should be possible to have progress and also have economic justice. Um, and, you know, in fact, you could say, like, what is progress if not improving people's lives? Can you be really said to be making progress if 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 people's lives are getting worse? And uh, so, you know, I think it's I think it's important to, you know, sort of make this distinction that um, you can be pro-technology, you can be in favor of progress, but also be opposed to capitalism. You can be in favor of improving workers' lives and still be in favor of technology and you know progress, however you define it. Yeah, I think that's a great point and especially kind of illuminating where agency is located in the system, as you were saying with the machine, right? It's not that the technology wants uh, automation or has to go in the direction of automation. It's the systems in, in which the technology is built that might push it towards one or another use. I'm wondering what you think, given that of sort of the tech determinism that characterizes a lot of technology development, where many of the arguments for these transformative technologies may stem from an analysis of the world that's you know very much, okay, a lot of these incentive structures are set, economic and social and nation state uh, political incentive structures are set in a certain way, and thus we may necessarily end up with X or Y vision of technology. And I think one really wonderful thing that narrative fiction can do in science fiction 
is illuminate kind of the contingency of many of the different ways the technologies ended up being created or adapted. So I'm wondering what, what you think the role is of sort of this type of speculative fiction in creating a narrative against some of that techno determinism that we see and that might indirectly ascribe agency to technology in a system rather than all of the things that surround the technology in that system. The people in power will always tell you that that the way things are is the only way things could be. There was really no other alternative. That's because they're in power uh, and they want to stop people from thinking about the fact that it was really just pure luck that they wound up there. This is line by the cultural theorist Mark Fisher that I often quote. The goal of emancipatory politics is to resist the idea of there being a natural order of things. It has to reveal that what we are told is inevitable is in fact contingent, and the things that we are told are impossible are in fact attainable. That is exactly the goal of science fiction. There is no natural order to things. What if the things that you took for granted were not in fact the case? What if things that you think are really strange were in fact accepted as completely normal? Those are things that science fiction does all the time. You know, that is one of the things that science fiction has in common, like progressive politics. And this is not to say that, that there hasn't been plenty of science fiction which has been very conservative. Obviously, lots of very conservative science fiction writers. What I think is the heart of science fiction is its ability to make people question their assumptions, to make people think about different possibilities. In terms of the contemporary technology you know, sort of landscape, there is this message that the current situation of, for instance, you know, giant companies ruling most of our online existence, that is the best way, the only way. In the 90s, when the internet was, was starting up, no one expected that would eventually become dominated by like five companies. Everyone thought that the internet would be a democratizing force. It would decentralize power. They were not deluded. That was an entirely possible scenario. It turned out things didn't go that way. But the fact that at the time, most of the smartest people thinking about these things, you know, they were not all in agreement about like, oh, well, yeah, I think eh, I think in about 30 years we'll have five companies and that'll be it. That was not a majority opinion. If the progress of technology were really inevitable, there, I think there would have been wide agreement. People are in general, you know, terrible at predicting the future. Everyone wants to think that in retrospect, oh, it was obvious. This was inevitable. Yeah, like, of course, this was the only way. If it were really obvious and inevitable, people would have known about it beforehand. Reminds me of that Alan Kay quote that I think has been overused at this point in Silicon Valley, the best way to predict the future is to invent it. And it seems like the best way to predict the future at this point is to convince people it's inevitable, um, which is a much easier thing to do than to invent it. I'm wondering what you were saying earlier about uh, science fiction has having this thing in common with progressive politics versus some more conservative um, stories. And I, a one, I read an interview you did where you kind of described this difference between implicitly conservative and implicitly progressive stories, kind of small c conservative, right? Like a return to the status quo type stories versus versus moving forward uh, progressive type stories. Maybe not how we think about those politically now, but perhaps and uh, how they treat the status quo differently. And I'm kind of wondering, you know, science fiction has spawned a huge amount of both of these types of stories. And and if you think that each answer is a different kind of question or or what the role of those two different types of stories are in, in charting out this kind of contingent future. A lot of people, their view of science fiction is shaped by Hollywood movies and TV. But the thing is that, you know, what Hollywood presents as science fiction is, uh, I think, not at all what science fiction is about. Because most of what Hollywood offers are stories of good versus evil. They follow this very recognizable pattern. At the beginning of the story, the world is implicitly in a good place. Then evil intrudes, ruins everything or threatens everything. The forces of good rise up and fight evil. And eventually they defeat evil. And the world goes back to being a good place. That story pattern, that is about restoring the status quo. It is about, you know, keeping things the way they were. And so in in that sense, it is implicitly conservative with a small c. Science fiction offers a, a different pattern of story. I think a prototypical science fiction story starts off with the world in a familiar place, and then there is a new discovery or a new invention, which changes things radically. And then at the end of the story, Things don't go back to the way they were. You can't uninvent 
your invention, you can't undiscover what you've discovered. These things have wide ranging effects and they are permanent. And so, you know, the story ends with the world fundamentally changed. This type of story is only possible, you know, in the last couple hundred years. This story only makes sense in the wake of the Industrial Revolution. You know, the world changed, but it changed on such a slow time scale that um, no one no one really saw their world ra change radically within their lifetime. Before that, you could mostly expect that the future would look a lot like the past. In the wake of the Industrial Revolution, now you know, we have this entirely different view of the future. The future is gonna be different than the past. And science fiction is a post-industrial revolution kind of storytelling. So yeah, science fiction stories, they are about change, about the inevitability of change. It's not that they are necessarily in favor of these changes or opposed to these changes. They are an acknowledgement that change is coming. So one of the reasons that good versus evil stories are so popular, one of the reasons that you know stories about restoring the status quo are so popular is that they are very comforting. We can all you know, recognize th the comfort that they provide. Stories about the world changing uh, permanently, those are not so comforting. That I think is one of the things that um, that science fiction specializes in, and that and I and again I should say, you know that's you know what I think of as like sort of the heart of science fiction, the core of science fiction is interested in that, but that is not what we generally see in what Hollywood offers as science fiction. What I think of as you know sort of real science fiction is engaged in something very different. It's about the inevitability of change, and you know how do we cope with that? How can we uh, adapt to change? And it is not it is not necessarily easy, and the stories about this are are not going to be as comforting or reassuring. But I think it is important for us to tell stories like this because we need we need to be thinking about these things. We need to be ready in our imaginations for change because because whether we like it, change is coming. You mentioned science fiction is sort of a post industrial revolution genre, and it feels like the pace of technological change may be accelerating. And I'm wondering, one, is that something that rings true to you and something that you think science fiction kind of can, can help us contend with? And secondly, you know, so many of your stories, I think, have these pieces of technology in them, like life logging, where you can perfectly recapture your previous memories or, um, you know, the prism where you can talk to another version of yourself. The life logging, for example, as you mentioned in the story, is is a very advanced form of recording things that may have started with writing, which is a transformative technology. Whereas the prism, um, talking to an alternate universe, well, it's unclear exactly where that fits in with existing technologies. How do you think about creating these different spaces of tech for your stories? Okay, so first I just want to address the point, like, is technological change happening faster now than it's ever been happening before? And, um, you know... I think that I think that's an interesting question. In one sense, you know, yes, technological change is happening really, really rapidly right now. But in another sense, because you know, other people have pointed out that if you think about how people's lives change at say like fifty year intervals, the interval of say between like eighteen ninety and nineteen forty, the changes there were enormous. Like electricity, automobiles, airplanes, the changes in that those technologies brought on people's everyday lives. The fact that that suddenly, like, oh, you had cheap electrical lighting, you had uh, electrical appliances. What a kitchen looked like in 1890 versus what a kitchen looked like in 1940 was radically different. The structure of of, of cities, you know, the the just the the way that you know people can move, you know, the the distances that you know of, that uh, we can travel. The, the communication options available, those were a huge, huge change. There's no, there, there's been no sort of 50 year interval in the past where changes were that big. But it's also unclear that there's any 50 year change, you know, since then that is anywhere near as big. Things have changed, but, you know, a kitchen today looks a lot like a kitchen 50 years ago. There are many, many aspects of, the, of our lives which would be perfectly recognizable to someone, you know, from 50 years ago, which at this point would be, say, 1970. Yes, there has been a lot of technological change since, uh, you know, 1970. But if you, you know, someone from the 70s, they could manage, they could recognize many things, they could adapt. It would not blow their minds quite the way that someone from the 1890s looking at, you know, brought, suddenly brought to the 1940s. 
it would not blow their minds in the same way. So I think you know that's also a, a you know an important perspective to bear in mind. Silicon Valley runs at this you know uh, really rapid pace. Is there anything that Silicon Valley has done is working on? That will change the world the way these other technologies change the world at the around the turn of the 20th century? Arguably not. I don't think it is as cut and dried to say that you know, technological change is increasing. In certain ways it is, but in other ways, maybe, maybe it's slowing down. I brought up these two examples, I think, on the prism and the life logging. You know, do you think those kinds of technologies or any of the technologies you put into your stories would change the world? I guess, more than, let's say, electricity. Like, do you, do you think any of the technologies in your stories qualify in that sense for if they existed, having that greater jump? No, no, I don't think so. Just speaking generally about the hypothetical technologies in my work, what I'm most interested in are sort of you know, certain philosophical questions that are raised by technology. In terms of, you know, life logging, I wrote that story mostly to talk about, you know, the ways that technology affects our cognition, our sense of ourself, uh, how we narrativize ourselves. And, you know, the story about, you know, the prism where you can communicate with uh, other versions of yourself, you know, that is entirely speculative. There's no good reason to think that any such technology will ever be possible. One of the basic aspects of the, of the many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics is that these other worlds, they may exist, but we can never communicate with them. The point of that story was not about, you know, like, uh, trying to imagine uh, a plausible, likely future technology. It was mostly about, you know, sort of the philosophical questions of like, what would such a technology do to our sense of self, how we think about ourselves and in a different way, how we narrativize ourselves. Um, so, you know, that, those are the types of things that I am most interested in my own writing. And those are somewhat independent of the question of, you know, what technology is likely to uh, arrive in the next, you know, few decades? You know, some of the technologies that are that are likely to arise in the next few decades, I think they are, you know, they have philosophically interesting, but others are not. And also, you know, some technologies or some, you know, some speculations that are philosophically interesting, they are not likely to arise. But yeah, like I'm, I'm interested in writing about them for their philosophical implications, not because of their, you know technological likelihood. My interests in my fiction writing, my motivations for exploring you know, these things in fiction, those are you know, maybe orthogonal to you know, the question of what do I think is you know, likely in, in the next, you know, or what, how I see technology going in the next you know, few decades. You know, it's possible that electricity, you know, probably really changed the way we see ourselves or interact with our environment or see that relationship between human and machine. Um, and many of the technologies you explore kind of also consider reconstituting those kinds of relationships, changing the way we narrativize ourselves, as you were saying, um, you know, maybe human AI relationships, maybe these questions of free will that I want us to get into. Do you see those different ways of narrativizing the self? I mean, one, I'd love to hear what those technologies that you think are likely are the most philosophically interesting ones, but two, you know, as we think about technology as a maybe a prompt for these philosophical questions, um, are there particular technologies, either historically or in science fiction, that you think have created more of a jump between how you may have seen yourself or narrativized yourself or constituted, you know, human society before and after uh, the advent of those technologies that may have forced those questions in a deeper way? As you noted, you know, in my story of on life logging, you know, I sort of draw a comparison to the invention of writing. I think that this is a really, you know, sort of interesting and maybe uh, underappreciated example of the way technology affects us cognitively. Because, you know, we're, you know, we are not used to thinking of writing as a technology, but writing absolutely is a technology. There are cultures which do not have writing and they get along fine. Writing is not a you know natural uh, intrinsic part of being human. You know, writing had to be invented. Writing affected us in a way that you know is I think very profound, but also very easy to overlook. You know, we are products of a, a literate society, 
And so, you know, we, you know, so literacy is sort of, you know, the water that we swim in and, and can't really see. But the literacy, the written word, you know, has profoundly shaped the way we think. In oral cultures, cultures that don't have a written language, they don't have a word for word. The idea of a word, you know, it's not one that they have because, you know, our idea of what a word is, that is tied to print, to, you know, to putting spaces in between letters. Words, they have a, they do have, you know, this sort of linguistic significance. There are a lot of things which have linguistic significance, which, you know, we don't think about because, you know, we're, we, most of us are not linguists. We think about words because, you know, we live in a literate society and we've sort of emphasized the idea of the word by putting spaces in between characters. People who live in an oral society, the way they think is different than the way that we think. Um, and, it, you know, it, it is different in such a way that, you know, I think it is very hard for for many of us to, to even conceive of. Speaking personally, you know, because, you know, I'm a writer. And so the written word is a very important part of who I am. Like a lot of people, you, you'd say like, well, if you were born in, in a completely different society, you know, what would you have turned out to be? And you know, like if you if you are into music, you know, you can imagine that like, OK, if you had been born in a different society, you would you would have still loved music. You would still perform music in some form because every society, they have music. I'm a writer. You know, what would I do if I were born in a society without, you know, writing? You know, there's, you know, there's nothing. There would be storytellers. But, you know, in, a, in an oral culture, storytelling, that's more of a performance thing. That's an example of the way that, you know, writing as a technology affects us cognitively in a, in a, in a very profound way. Because, and, I, and I think, you know, even if you are not a writer, you know, many, many people in our society, writing, you know, shapes the way that they think. I think most people, if, if they're writing a speech, if they're composing a speech, they write it down. You know, they're using a keyboard or whatever, but they are writing down what they're going to say when they're planning out a speech. You know, and that's for something that they're actually going to give orally. You know, why do we do that? Most people would not want to try and, you know, compose a speech that they were going to give you know, without ever, you know, using a single, you know, piece of paper. We are not good at composing things purely in our heads. Writing as a new technology, as a new medium, affected our cognition in, in a lot of ways. What is the successor to writing in that regard? What new technology, what new medium will affect our cognition the way that writing did? Just to, to um, talk about my story in more detail. So I wrote this story called The Truth of Fact, The Truth of Feeling. That story is about life logging in particular. And the focus of that story is less on, you know, cognition and more on, actually, I guess, our notion of truth, of what constitutes accurate history. Because, you know, nowadays, we who live in a literate culture, we privilege writing as a record of uh, historical events, as an accurate record of events. Because, you know, if, if we find a document that was written in the 1700s, we place great value on that on the accuracy of that document. But in an oral culture, they would not. They would say, like, you got a piece of paper that's, you know, really old and it's got some marks on it. Like, so what? Who cares? You know, that's not going to tell you anything important. By analogy, what that story uh, is investigating is, you know, whether life logging might have some similar effect. Uh, a, a video record of something that happened in your past, that will be, you know, in many regards, more reliable than your own organic memory of what happened. But, you know, is that sort of uh, technical accuracy the most important thing? Um, is it more important than your own personal recollection of what happened? You know, that's a question up for debate. You know, I think you can argue the pros and cons of that. That story is just one example of a broader set of questions about the ways that technology affects our cognition in along many different axes. What, what do we gain and what do we lose with each of these you know, uh, technologies, each of these new mediums? On that idea of the ways that how we live may be transformed by these technologies, one of the most I think transformative types of technology that you sort of deal with in your work is these 
versions of technology that, that question uh, the boundary between free will and determinism. To me, squarely in the speculative side, you know, it's not at all about this is going to happen using the lens of speculative fiction. And I'm sort of wondering when you think about these, it, it sort of takes different directions and different stories, right? And some of the, in one of the stories on the predictor, um, this knowledge that free will doesn't exist uh, can send people into a, a waking coma state and they, they lose all motivation. And it's kind of told in this sense of uh, this self-deception, I believe is a term used. And then there are other stories where it makes characters more determined to live up to the fullness of their lives. And I'm kind of wondering how you see these different branches of how something is one of the major questions of philosophy of mind, right, uh, interrogated in your stories, how those different branches come about and kind of what your own thoughts are on uh, on free will and whether it can be reconciled. The question of free will in a deterministic universe is one that I am very interested in and one that I keep returning to in my fiction. So I'll say, you know, that uh, I'll say right off the bat that, you know, like, I'm a materialist. I believe the universe is made only of matter. And I believe behavior of matter is entirely described by deterministic physical laws. A lot of people are resistant to this idea because they feel like it means that they have no free will. I've come around to the compatibilist position, which is a, a position in philosophy that uh, says that free will is actually entirely compatible with a deterministic universe. The questions around free will, I think, remain kind of endlessly fascinating. You know, there are certain thought experiments that, you know, you can sort of pose, which I think really uh, sharpen the question of free will in a deterministic universe in a way that, you know, don't currently exist. Because, you know, there is no way for us to get information about the future. Um, uh, and there are good reasons why, you know, there is very strong, you know, uh, scientific arguments and physics based arguments as to why we will never get good information from the, about the future. In a deterministic universe, it's not impossible that there would be good information about the future. Uh, uh, it's not logically impossible. And so, you know, what would that mean if you, you know, if you had access to, you know, good information about the future? You know, I think that poses a, a problem for, uh, uh, for free will, which, you know, is not a problem in our, in our world. I come back to this the self deception word from um, the predictor. I don't have the sentence in front of me, but I think it's something like civilization depends on your self de uh, deception. Perhaps it always has, which to me feels very much a comment on our world, perhaps, and not just the world in, in which the predictor is set. As you were saying, although our world may be one in which it's much easier to to justify a compatibilist hypothesis. So I'm kind of wondering, do you think? Uh, how do you think about self-deception in that sense? Uh, and, and what were you, what was in your mind when you were writing that? The story that you're talking about is called What's Expected of Us. In the story, there is a device that becomes readily available, which sends a little bit of information backwards in time. And so people are able to get, you know, uh, like one bit of information from their future. So they're not getting a lot of information, but the, the fact that they're getting inf any information at all as you, as you said, leads people into, you know, leads a lot of people into a sort of catatonic state because it has messed their sense of vol volition so profoundly. I almost regret having written that story because I think a lot of people have uh, taken it to mean that I believe that we don't have free will. And I do believe we have free will. That was a horror story. But okay, so like, I'm going to take this opportunity to talk about compatibilism and, you know, why I, why I think we do have free will. Okay, so I think a lot of people, they feel like, oh, well, if we are just made out of matter, then this matter is all governed by physical laws, then, you know, all of my decisions were, uh, you know, the product of, you know, atoms interacting, uh, which are the result of other atoms interacting in the past, which, you know, and their interactions were the result of other atoms further in the past. And so everything that, you know, everything that I do as a person, you know, was, uh, uh, was determined at the, you know, the Big Bang. And so people say like, well, okay, so I guess that means that, you know, I don't have free will. Some pe people who, you know, who dislike the idea of determinism, what they want is they want to say like, okay, like when I make a decision, when I choose between A or B, when I choose between option A and option B, that choice, you know, is not the product of anything, you know, any atomic interaction prior to that 
point in time that you know the universe in which I choose option A and the universe in which I choose option B, those universes are identical up until my decision point. And it's, it is only that decision which distinguishes those two universes. In that scenario, what is your decision based on? What is your basis for choosing option A over option B? It cannot be the result of any experience you've had because those, your experiences were exactly the same in both scenarios. It can't be the result of any thought you've had because, again, all of those were you know identical. It's not the result of anything you read, anything you learned, anything anyone ever said to you. It is basically you know a, a, a sort of quantum coin flip which happened at that moment of decision making. That is not a good basis for making a decision. You know that you know that doesn't give you any you know sort of moral responsibility. That that means you just flip the coins you know at, and made the decision decision that way. And that's you know I don't think that's what we actually want from free will. Your decision is this kind of you know extremely intricate computation. The inputs to that computation are everything that has ever happened to you in your life. And this computation is producing outputs on an ongoing basis. And, you know, those outputs feedback, you know, they become inputs of this computation. And, you know, at this moment, at a particular moment that you make a decision, that is the output of your computation. That is what determinism gives you. It is not an easily predicted one because no one else has the countless billions of inputs. No one else has, you know, every moment of your life, which are, the, which are the things that went into that decision, that computation. That is what I think we actually want from free will. We want our decisions to arise out of our experiences and our, you know, our thought processes. We learn things, we, we weigh things in our minds, and then we, you know, we arrive at some conclusion. And, you know, all of the things that we are weighing, you know, they're not easily enumerated um, because yeah, they number in the billions. You know that that is what being a being a, a deterministic machine gives you. I'm curious how that interacts. Um, you know, with if this covers what we want out of free will. I mean, what we want out of consciousness, in some sense, which is obviously the other one of the other big questions in, in philosophy of mind. And I think it seems to interact a lot, particularly when we think about you know, how consciousness arises in, in non-human systems. And if it is the case that um, we have, you know, a deterministic brain with these billions and billions of inputs, as you're saying, and that's kind of how we uh, create compatibility between free will and determinism, where does that tell, what does that tell us, I guess, about how consciousness arises and where it can and cannot arise, um, given this view of, of sort of how we make decisions, what we want out of and I love that framing. It's like we get what we want out of free will in this. Uh, we don't have the the type of free will you described at first, but that's not really what we want out of free will. You know, what do we then kind of want out of consciousness, and what does this tell us about that? We can you know, sort of shift to talking about AI and sort of the speculative uh, notions of AI, conscious software, and conscious machines. This type of AI is radically different than AI as it exists in the real world right now. People use the word AI all the time. Right now, most of what is marketed as AI is, I'd say, basically applied statistics. Yeah, so when people say like, oh, yeah, we're going to use AI for, you know, uh, hiring decisions, it's like, well, yeah, we're going to use a lot of applied statistics for hiring decisions or, you know, uh, credit worthiness determinations. Yeah, we're, uh, they're using a lot of applied statistics. But that's entirely different than, say, like a conscious machine, you know, which is also something that people refer to as AI, but that is, you know, they are radically, radically different. We can talk about uh, conscious machines, but as long as we're, as long as we, we're clear that, you know, conscious machines are uh, not anything that uh, people are referring to now when they talk about AI, it's something completely different. It's a sort of a reflection of our, uh, how impoverished our vocabulary is that we wound up using the same phrase to refer to these two radically different ideas. I'm, I'm happy to talk about conscious machines as long as you know, we're, we're clear that you know, this has nothing to do with AI in the real world. <laughs> yeah, this is highly speculative. In some sense, I see there being an expansion of where we generally see consciousness maybe coming out of even some of the reactions to calling AI or machines conscious in terms of saying, 
well, our large natural systems, for example, you know, is there some consciousness in a huge mushroom colony or in a forest? And I think there have been arguments to say, well, there are some ways in which we could we could locate consciousness in these non-machine or non-human places. And obviously there's the classic uh, question of are animals conscious? But, you know, I'm wondering in all of these different ways that we locate consciousness, both in AI, uh, potentially speculative AI and humans and in all of these other systems, um, kind of how do you see those different consciousnesses with this idea of, of free will and are they, do they have to go together? So just as a you know, really uh, oversimplified uh, way of looking at it, we'd say like, you know, okay, so chimpanzees, dolphins, you know, their consciousness is probably the closest to ours uh, of, of animals. You know, dogs, less so, but still, you know, close. You know, further away, you know, you have something like mice. You know, further away, you have something like, you know, goldfish. Even if we, like, go with that sort of a scale like that, uh, I don't think, like, any, like, I don't think any software that we currently have, you know, really warrants being uh, anywhere being placed on that scale. I think, you know, the software we have right now is closer to, like, an amoeba or uh, probably not even an amoeba. I, I don't think we have any software right now that I would grant, you know, the same conscious uh uh, status as I would that I would grant an amoeba. Do you just have a, a sense of oh, you know, if I saw X thing happen or this was proved to me, not with any of the technology we currently have, but at some point in the future, this is quite a speculative question, I guess. But do you see something as kind of changing your mind on that? I'm, I'm specifically kind of calling back a little bit to your piece on the life cycle of software projects, um, which has you know these entities called Digients and has a very kind of humanistic exploration of this human AI relationship that's a lot more like a parent-child relationship than obviously anything we see in current technology or even in the direction of technology. But I'm wondering if there's some something that, that could change your view of, of where machines would go on this spectrum. A lot of that is sort of um, hinted at in that story that you refer to, life cycle of software objects. You know, if we, if there was some software development effort which produced software uh, whose behaviors were, you know, comparable to that of uh, animals, um, so that you know, initially, you know, uh, there, you know, we we started seeing software entities which, uh, you know, behaved like beetles. And then, you know, further development along this track prefer, uh, produced software entities which behaved like, you know, mice. And then further development produced software entities that behaved like, you know, dogs. If I saw a progression like that, then yes, I would absolutely start give, you know, granting them conscious, you know, so this, the same status that I grant, you know, uh, beetles or mice or dogs. But, you know, like right now we have no, no one is doing anything like that. There isn't any research being put into that. I don't think there's anything, uh, say, um, like a, that the law, about the laws of physics, which would prevent that. Um, but I think, you know, it would be very difficult. What would it take for me to, you know, change my mind? Yeah, it would, it would take, I would have to see, you know, uh, some, some software development effort, software entities that seem to have like very, very simple cognition, uh, and then, you know, uh, as it progressed, it would uh, produce entities with you know, sort of uh, more sophisticated modes of cognition. Then I would absolutely, you know, uh, accept that it was producing entities with uh, human-like cognition, and yeah, that they and software entities that were conscious in the way that humans are conscious, and that des deserve you know moral consideration. In the same way that you know uh, chimpanzees or you know human beings deserve moral consideration, and this sort of ties into the question you were saying, like you know, would so would would could these software entities have free will? And so again, you know, like if we, I, you know, I think we could you know sort of put this on a spectrum, like you know, do, do dogs have free will? Arguably not. You know, uh, we certainly don't blame dogs for the things they do, and we also you know can't say that like they engage in a lot of you know sort of moral deliberation. It's interesting, though, legally, I guess we do hold dogs accountable via their 
owners, I guess, sometimes for certain behaviors, you have to muzzle your dog or even them down. So there's well, like a I slight mean, amount. We, 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 no, the dogs have no culpability. Their owners have culpability. Dogs do not have any culpability. And it's also worth noting, you know, dogs also basically, they have almost no legal protection. You know, dog, dogs are euthanized, you know, by the thousands every day. And uh, there, there's uh, there's no law that that stops that. So, yeah, dogs in, in themselves, they have almost no legal protection. The Any, any laws around dogs are actually laws around the owners of dogs. This is one area where, you know, you know, sort of the legal protections, you know, are not that, I think, far removed from like our certain, a certain degree of um, our moral intuitions, because, you know, we don't think dogs can be held responsible for things. You know, um, you know, if a dog, uh, if a dog bites someone, you know, we can't, we don't really say like, you know, that, uh, that dog is evil. You know, we might destroy that dog, but it's not, it's not a punishment against the dog. It's just sort of a, you know, public safety measure. Um, uh, we, we don't really hold the dog morally culpable the way we would if a person, you know, attacked uh, another person. Cause we, cause yeah, because we don't think that dogs have moral agency. Dogs are capable of a, of you know a reasonable level of cognition. You know they're they're conscious of many things. They have emotions, um, and yeah, and you know they definitely you know uh, are intelligent. But but yeah, we, we don't think that they have moral agency. We don't uh, uh, um, we don't really think they have free will. And so. Uh, so similarly, you know, for a, you know, some hypothetical s software agent, for it to have free will, it would have to have, you know, an incredibly high level of cognitive capabilities. We started with this question on technology and capitalism. I've sort of been talking about um, speculative fiction as illuminating some of these philosophical questions. And you mentioned way at the beginning, um, you know, Luddites as being quite interested in economic justice rather than destroying technology for its own sake, the separation of caring about progress and sort of being pro-capitalism. I'm kind of wondering, there's been pushback against a lot of techno-optimist narratives in Silicon Valley and the tech space generally um, for a lot of very good reasons. I imagine many in our community will be familiar with, so I won't reiterate them. Um, but after acknowledging those very real harms, you know, there's also incredible progress to be made, the spirit of discovery that I think is captured in a lot of your work um, and, and, you know, even spiritual wonder in some sense. So in separating technological progress from, in many ways, the, the failures and harms that the systems that the tech is built under have perpetuated, do you think there's a vision of techno-optimism that can be reclaimed and kind of what do you think that that narrative might look like or, or how, how do we write that story, I guess, in a in a world that still has many of those systems and so can still perpetuate those harms where where we might want, you know, different different alternatives. Let's talk about this in the context of utopias and dystopias. People are often very dismissive of the idea of utopia. It may be time to rethink what we mean by the, the word utopia. When people say like, oh, you know, like we, we can imagine some utopian society where everyone is happy. You know, that is a fairy tale. That is sort of the societal version of the happily ever after ending of fairy tales where, you know, the prince and the princess, they marry and they live happily ever after. And, you know, it's this it's this idea that, oh, yeah, they they get married and uh, every, you know, the rest of their lives is happy. You know, they never fight, you know, they never have any problems. It's just, you know, it's a smooth sailing. One of the reasons people criticize, you know, you know, that type of fairy tale story is that it provides a really unrealistic idea of what marriage is, of what relationships are. A good marriage, a good relationship is not one in which like, oh, you never fight, in which nothing bad ever happens, in which you are, you know, it's just constant, you know, never ending bliss. That is that is not a realistic depiction of of relationships of marriage. You know, marriage requires work. Marriage requires you know effort. Um, being a, in a good relationship means 
being willing to put in the effort. You know, if we, if we consider, yeah, American society to a marriage. Right now, we are in an, an abusive marriage. We, you know, we are in a highly dysfunctional relationship. What we aspire to is not a, is not a happily ever after, you know, uh, eternal bed of roses kind of relationship. It is one that is not abusive. It is, it is what, we, what we aspire to is a functional relationship. I don't know if we need to get rid of the word utopian or we just need to, you know, change what people think of when, you know, when talking about it. if we keep associating the idea of utopia with something of some, uh, some ideal of, uh, eternal happiness, you know, of course, of course people are going to be dubious of the idea of utopia because, because that is a fairy tale. What we are hoping for is a healthier, more functional society, just like a healthy and functional relationship. Any attempts at, you know, sort of depicting a or imagining a better future, those should be understood as attempts at imagining a healthier and more functional relationship for society as a whole, a way of stopping dysfunctional pattern of ending cycles of abuse. It's not about, you know, a fairy tale. It's not about, you know, making a fairy tale real or, you know, making happily ever after come about. It's about, you know, trying to uh, make things work in a way, in ways that things currently do not work. I think that's the kind of pragmatic optimism that uh, we really need. But what you're kind of laying out is, is how do we improve our process, right? Which I think is also in a lot of ways how we work on relationships. And I'm hopeful that um, some of the ideas that we look at in Radical Exchange can contribute to that. Uh, Ted, thank you so much for, for being here and, and speaking with me. It's incredibly exciting as a longtime fan and I'm sure super valuable to the community as well. Thanks for having me. Our mission is to build and fund the open internet, and we do that by empowering digital creatives to earn a living building it. At Gitcoin, we are a collection of digital creatives ourselves, and we have a deep reverence for our communities of practice. We became frustrated because open source technologies that make up the open internet are severely underfunded, yet they enable over $500 billion in economic output per year. But more importantly, they help humanity solve some of our most pressing coordination problems. To us, these technologies are digital public goods. We all use them, and they are extremely important, but no one is incentivized to build and maintain them. We build Gitcoin to solve this issue by getting digital creatives paid to work on open source projects, and by creating opportunities for learning and connecting with like-minded peers, teaming up on projects together. We are building an entire ecosystem around supporting digital public goods, but in order to do that in a mission-driven way, we have to decentralize Gitcoin itself. That's why we're launching GTC, to evolve Gitcoin into a community-governed DAO. GTC is the governance token of the Gitcoin network, and it can be used for things like managing the treasury, settling disputes, and creating policy. And in Gitcoin grants, the community will use GTC to ratify grants rounds, surface curated collections, and help mitigate civil attacks on the quadratic funding mechanism. GTC puts the future of Gitcoin's community in your hands, so you can help direct and support digital public goods. Join us to build a world where open source technologies are funded in a democratic way, a world we call quadratic lands a better, freer world for digital creatives everywhere. Together, we'll take the journey to quadratic lands. Get started today at quadraticlands.com.
Hello, I'm Audrey Tong, Taiwan's Digital Minister. Really happy to share with friends around the world about our digital democracy. Now, it's rare to hear those two words mixing together because democracy is an ancient concept that goes back to the ancient Athens, but digital is much more recent. But in Taiwan, the internet and democracy began literally at the same year. To me, democracy means working with the people, not just for the people. And digital democracy is a way for us to transcend the time and space boundaries so people around the globe in different time zones can also make decisions together. In Taiwan, we countered the pandemic with no lockdown and countered the infodemic with no takedowns. If the technologies are controlled in the hands of a few, then people feel less and less empowered when it concerns issues of common interest, for example, rationing out masks, uh, tracing the contacts of infected people or distributing vaccines in a fair way. We need open innovations from around all the corners of our society and the world in order to make it fast, fair and fun. So a democracy that's fast, fair and fun need to scale using the help of digital technologies. In Taiwan, our first presidential election was in 1996. And that was also the year that the Wild Web became really popular in Taiwan. So internet and democracy in Taiwan are not two things, but rather one and the same thing, just like bubble and tea, that could be mixed together in any which way. Because in many ancient republics and democracies, people think of democracy as something that's fixed, like uploading three bits of information every person every four years called voting. But because in Taiwan, democratization takes place on the internet, so we have higher bandwidth of democracy, of participatory budgeting, of sandbox applications, presidential hackathon, citizens' initiatives, so on and so forth. I believe that bubble tea represents the spirit of open innovation. It could be white tapioca ball, black tapioca ball, it could be red tea, it could be any kind of tea really. Uh, but as long as they're mixed together, it gives rise to creativity and enjoyment around the world. And people can adapt this open innovation without fear of being sued uh, by patents or copyright or trademark losses. And that means that uh, uh, innovation is very easy to make from the front line to uh, empower people closest to the pain or to the thirst, as it were, uh, and people can make their own recipes and freely share it around the world. And that's the spirit of Taiwanese digital democracy. When I was a child, Taiwan was still under the martial law. And indeed, we relied on international correspondence in, for example, Hong Kong, to report the human rights violations during Taiwan's martial law era, and also to strategize on how to change Taiwan for the better. Now, fast forward to today, of course, we've been ranked as the most open and democratic society in our corner of the world. So it's our turn to provide this international stage for people, per perhaps in Hong Kong, perhaps now moved to Taiwan, to voice their concerns about the backsliding of democracy in their regions, about the worry that authoritarianism may take over, and strategize with people around the world to make sure that the democratic polities work together to advance, not just defend, democracy. As I said in the Oslo Freedom Forum, ring the bells that still can ring. Forget our perfect offering. There is a crack, a crack in everything. And that's how the light gets in. With more and more of our lives being moved online, 
The world is changing faster than ever. And through the global village of the internet, diverse cultures are coming into contact and conflict at a pace that our institutions just can't keep up with. But as we've seen today, there are creative individuals and communities developing innovative tools, systems, and ideas that we hope have inspired you and left you with the sense that a radically egalitarian and participatory future is within reach. We thank you again for watching. Stay tuned next week for the final program on December 17th, where we'll be in Denver. This is Radical Exchange, a new era of democracy.